Welcome to episode 95 of the Necronama.com. Charlie Howard was a young, small-boned man who suffered from asthma. He'd been small as a child and was bullied aggressively throughout his life for his stature and his sexual orientation. It was so bad Charlie didn't attend his own high school graduation to spare his family the taunts he often received. After a failed relationship, Charlie moved to Bangor, Maine, home of author Stephen King. Charlie was homeless until welcomed into the home of some friends he made. Charlie engaged in the community, worked hard for others, and found a place that he felt he fit in. Not an easy task for a very openly, flamboyantly gay man in the early 80s. But not all were tolerant of his lifestyle. Charlie was tormented by local high school boys, asked to leave a local nightclub after dancing with another man, and even attacked by a woman in a local supermarket. One day, Charlie found his pet kitten had been strangled to death, a clear warning from the less accepting members of Banger's township. Around 10 p.m. on July 7, 1984, Charlie left a party with his boyfriend, Roy Ogden. As Charlie and Roy walked up State Street and began to cross the Kandusky River Bridge, a car full of high school teenagers slowed down. Seeing Charlie, several of the boys got out of the car and decided to give chase, shouting epithets. Charlie did not get far as his asthma kicked in. He fell, unable to catch his own breath. Pouncing on Charlie, the boys beat him and kicked him. One shouted to throw Charlie over the bridge and grabbed him by the legs. The others lifted him. Pleading for his life, Charlie grabbed the rail and begged them not to throw him in the river as he could not swim. Prying his hands loose, the boys pushed him over the side of the bridge, returned to the car, and left the scene. Charlie's boyfriend Roy ran for help and pulled the first fire alarm he came to on State Street. Around 1 a.m., local law enforcement found the body of Charlie Howard. An autopsy would show that he suffered from an extreme asthma attack and drowned. Returning to the party that they'd been at, the boys bragged about their encounter. The next day, one of the boys turned himself in when he found out Charlie had died. The other two boys decided to leave town on a freight train, and then thought better of it, returned home, and they were arrested. This event galvanized the Banger community in very similar ways that the killing of Matthew Shepard did to the rest of the United States, although definitely never on the same level of national notoriety. Stephen King has stated that this crime was the thing that made him realize the extent of violence faced by LGBTQ plus people. He also said that, as a straight man, he had the privilege of not having to think about this kind of issue, and felt that it was this kind of complacency and ignorance that led to Charlie's murder. Today, a short distance from where Charlie Howard was murdered, there is a monument that reads, May we, the citizens of Bangor, continue to change the world around us until hatred becomes peacemaking and ignorance becomes understanding. The anniversary of Charlie Howard's death, July 7th, has been marked as Diversity Day in Bangor ever since. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And if I had to pick one character to be in the movie It, it would be Georgie, so that I could be done 10 minutes into this film. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Don Guillory, author, historian, educator, co-host of this podcast. And um, yeah, uh, I don't have any characters that I would uh, choose to be in this film, but I, I definitely related to a few of the, the characters in this film. Um, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem like being black and dairy is a good thing, huh? <laughs> No, no. I felt for Mikey. I felt for Mikey. <laughs> All right. So joining us today, Dr. Michael Bluen is here. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to the, sh welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to uh, be joining you both. Awesome. So you have a book that definitely ties into what we're doing here today. So I'm going to let you talk about that in just a second. But why don't you go ahead and let our listeners know a bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I am a uh, professor. Uh, I teach in a lot of different fields uh, at a liberal arts college. I, I teach um, about, I teach film studies, teach some literature, teach some just more general humanities type courses. 
Um, but yeah, I have a long-standing research interest in the macabre. So uh, I've written and and studied horror film and horror literature now for uh, well over a decade and um, just continues to be the, the area that I'm most interested in uh, professionally and I would say personally. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to be here today to talk about it and to talk about all things Stephen King. I guess within the big horror umbrella, under the umbrella of horror, I would say Stephen King is probably my uh, biggest touchstone, my, my, the thing that I keep returning to habitually, kind of like the people in It, just habitually, cyclically returning to Stephen King over and over again. <laughs> I can't quite escape from Stephen King, and so I'm, I'm stuck in a loop with him. Uh, but yeah, I just find his work to be endlessly problematic and delightful in uh, equal measure, probably. So yeah, that's that's a little bit about who I am. I'm actually teaching this semester uh, a class called Stephen King's America, uh, where we are working our way through some of these big social, cultural, political issues in Stephen King's uh, fiction, and uh, having having a great time. I mean, really has been a lot of fun getting to teach this stuff. So I'm I'm thrilled to be here talking to you about it. And I'd love cool. to take a course like that. You yeah, should I, check out his new book. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I have two recent books on Stephen King that just came out, and that was not the intention to stack them on top of each other like that. I had no but idea the, there were two. Now there I are, have to get there, the other one. There are two. There's The first one that came out is this last summer called Stephen King and American History, and I wrote that with Tony Magistrali, who is uh, one of the leading King experts. I actually had him for a professor many moons ago. Oh, that's and, cool. Uh, so I got to write the book with him, which was a thrill. And So he and I wrote that book, which kind of deals with Stephen King's understanding of American history uh, as a vague concept, as a cosmic force, though that kind of like how he understands history to move us in invisible ways, that kind of thing. And the the book that just came out very recently, uh, like less than a week ago, two weeks ago now, uh, is Stephen King and American Politics a book that dives into the long and complicated relationship between Stephen King and American politics. So I am, uh, you know, teaching the class Stephen King's America was a natural fit because I'm right now just so immersed in Stephen King and all things America uh, that it, it just, you know, the time was right to teach a class on that topic. So, yeah, those are the two books. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping I can kind of, talk to you all about that as we're as we're discussing it but it's um oh, definitely I, I was really happy to see it out and it seems to a lot of folks out there who i know who are in the stephen king universe so to speak uh it, they seem to be enjoying it so obviously that's a very you know y you feel good when you pour in all that effort and time and people actually don't think it's terrible that it's a good feeling I mean, for me, like as soon as I saw the cover and like the title alone, I was intrigued. I was like Stephen King and American politics like that just that that's everything. Everything he does is tied into Americana in some way. And yeah. I I will fully admit and maybe horror world will kick me right out. But I have never been a diehard King fan. I either love his books or I'm like, eh. You know, yeah. like I'm not the uh, I'm not the guy that has to get every one. To be honest, if I get one, I get it at the library first because there's been so many that I stopped reading like a third of the way through that I'm like I'm not dropping that much cash anymore, right? Yeah, it, and, there are there's some real stinkers. That, that's just undeniable. Yeah, but when I say that, I also his grasp of pop culture, America, how Americans are and why those are untouchable. Like everything he lacks in plotting, he makes up for there. You know, I, I think for, for me, it was, um, you know, and again, I, I think this book is definitely not a book that is a cheerleader book. This is not a book that's designed for only like fans of Stephen King, because there's a lot of criticism in the book on Stephen King's inability to deal with some of these important political issues. Mm -hmm. Most importantly being, I think what what would really 
people who are super familiar with Stephen King would find the title maybe to be surprising because Stephen King is so outwardly apolitical. I mean, his his books strive to, you know, get rid of any sign, any semblance of political agenda. And and this book is uh, definitely takes him to task for uh, it, it both celebrates some of the things he does well, but it also takes him to task for some of the things that he is that are more problematic within mm-hmm. his work. And so, you know, I really I would say if you're a diehard fan who only wants to read glowing praise for Stephen King, uh, that Stephen King's American and American politics is probably not a good book for you. But if you're somebody <laughs> who enjoys, I, I think what I appreciate about is uh, appreciate about King is that he really gets us thinking and debating and discussing some really important things that are going on in our culture. Um, but I think one of the most surprising things probably for people who are really familiar with King is the fact that I wrote a book about Stephen King and politics because he is so outwardly not political and his books habitually come back to that point to say, you know, listen, a good story is a good story and it has nothing to do with politics. And he just hates people who have political ideas. He hates, uh, you know, politicians and the way they talk. He much prefers the quote unquote blue collar uh, you know, the, the typical Stephen King hero who is divorced from social governance completely. And so I, I think the book really tries to explore how Stephen King can be both one of our most political writers covering, mm-hmm. you know, topics from abortion to Vietnam to uh, very critical of uh, the George W. Bush administration, especially mm-hmm. in books books like Under the Dome. And he can be all of those things and still claim to be at least not a political writer. And so the book really kind of teases out the tension between what is Stephen King's attitude toward politics? How does he understand what politics even means? And how do his confusions about American politics maybe speak to our own larger confusions about what American politics is supposed to be and and supposed to, you know, uh, achieve? Okay. Well, and so what I would add to that is you have something like on guns or even the abortion debate in insomnia. Yeah. He goes round and round. He hits every side of these debates makes them logical, makes them makes you understand why people feel the things they feel, even if you completely disagree. And yeah. then I feel like it just drops off, which, you know, is my complaint with most of his stories. <laughs> but yeah. uh, my problem with it isn't, hey, Stephen, I need to know, are you a Republican or a Democrat? I need to know how you feel about this. It's not that. It's that he has the ultimate voice and audience and refuses to use it to help people. Yeah. And and I will take, I will take full. You can blame me if you don't agree with that. I will take responsibility for what I just said. It's just me, but that's how I feel. And it's one of the things I really detest about him because he spends so much time analyzing people and then doesn't use that to help people. Yeah, I think and, you're, abs- and you're I, absolutely And I right. know that he gives like $4 billion to charity every year. I get that. I'm just saying the power of a voice speaking for somebody is huge. And I know we're going to talk about that in a while as well. Well, it, that is, I mean, we'll have to come back to the question of identity politics and Stephen King's very, it, it is just, it's problematic. I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to fully grasp what he's trying to do with identity politics in, as far as race and gender are concerned. I mean, he has been hammered by critics over and over again for, for his failure to, to represent minority groups uh, effectively or even at times humanely. There, there's some very real critiques to be made there. And, and I just think what's interesting for me is that King, everything I, I read in King, I, I try to connect back, and he does too, to the 60s. He's such yes. a, a child of the 60s. And for him, I think he all he wants is revolution against authoritarians. You see so many Nixons in Stephen King's 
uh, body of work. He, he's doing battle with Nixon over and over and over again. And on one hand, he wants revolution. He wants people to be highly individualists. I mean, be, really try to carve out your own unique nomadic path in this world without feeling burdened by community, which is, again, I think a theme in it that we'll have to talk about. But the, the question of are we supposed to be connected to our community or like, uh, you know, a degree of removal from our community. That's, a, that's an ongoing tension within Stephen King's work. But as he does that, what he essentially does is eliminates the all attempts to govern, all attempts to make political engagement happen. He, he labels all of that as utopian. And in his mind, it's because it's utopian, it's no good. And, you know, and that's it. So that that's where the dead end that you were just describing, I think, takes place. He doesn't have a vision for political engagement or political thought even because every political engagement ends up in authoritarianism. So all he ends up doing is retreating back into that lone white guy wandering in the wilderness. And that's pretty much all he can really achieve, even though he wants very much to break out of the kind of fascist tendencies of American history, he can't figure out what that exactly means. Like, are we supposed to be more democratic? Everybody throughout his in novels over and over and over again, here I'm thinking about, you know, his uh, teleplay he did, uh, Storm of the Century. He just, and he does this, you know, so often, he, he just doesn't trust the people to make decisions. The, the people, when you let like the masses participate in the process of governing or the pro the process of leading a community, it's always bad news. It always leads to some kind of bloodbath. It's always zealotry. You, ju you just, you can't trust voters. You can't trust the public to be involved in, uh, in governing the community. And, and that's a really, I think a pretty by now normalized attitude in American culture is like politics is bad and we should all just resist politics. But on the other hand, there's this anxiety, this kind of hand wringing about, you know, if, if we were to become more political, if everybody actually voted and actually became engaged, what kind of nightmare would we, would that lead to? And I think Stephen King often imagines because people in his universe are not to be trusted. The masses mm -hmm. are gullible, uh, easily duped. Um, and uh, so it's best to just like at the end of uh, the mist, it's best to just get in the car and drive and try to build your own society somewhere or in the stand even, you know, which again is coming around and is more popular today because of the you know, recent remake or at least popular to talk about. Um, in, in a book like The Stand, there's just this knowledge that human beings, every time they try to organize their society – every time they try to build a government, it is internally not going to work. And it just collapses and leads to just wandering and just people alone wandering the world, trying to make connections with very small groups of people. Like a, an ideal Stephen King community is like four people. It can't, <laughs> it, it, it can't get any bigger than that because his vision of American politics is extremely narrow which I think, you know, if you think about it, it really does tap into the dichotomy of the kind of binary existence of living in America right now, right? Which is the fear of uh, authoritarians, the fear of, you know, populists. I mean, it does seem like his novel, The Outsider, is all about that fear, all about Donald Trump and the fear of fascism in America. But at the same time, uh, we fear what happens when too many people make demands on the government, the too, like too many protests, too much involvement, too much engagement. What happens if everybody actually gets involved in American politics? And, and there's this anxiety, especially for people who are trying to keep the status quo alive, this anxiety that there is such a thing as too much democracy. And so for me, it's that Frision, that kind of schism between those two thought processes that really characterize all of Stephen King's fiction. And that's really what the book tries to argue is that it's that tension between those two attitudes that helps us to make sense of why Stephen King so often disappoints us when it comes to political resolutions. Wow, that was awesome. 
I mean, I don't, I don't have a way to follow that. So Don, what do you got? I, should, I was just thinking, I'm like, man, I should be, uh, I should have like filled up three notebooks with, with. <laughs> we have it recorded. It'll be okay. No, it doesn't uh, matter. I have, to, I have to take the notes. <laughs> well, and I think it just it makes the point like I would just say for all of us, whether you're a King fan or not, I, I just feel like that that debate is one that is the time is right for us. The time is right to revisit Stephen King on these grounds because right. we don't know what the heck is going on. Like we are we are clearly disoriented as as a society right now and coming at things from all different angles. I just feel like Stephen King opens invites us to have these discussions that I think are super interesting and super important. I want to kick over to the film, but to get there, I want to start with a little bit about myself. And then I'm going to ask each of you to do the same, although it doesn't have to be as in depth by any means. Um, I've never liked it. I didn't like the book. I didn't like the, the mini series. I don't really like the two new films. And, and here's the thing with that though. It still sticks with me. No matter what I do, I've been thinking about these films for the last week since I watched them. Anyone who was on Facebook or Twitter following me, I have been like live statusing what I hate, what I like, what doesn't work for me. And the conclusion that I came to happened because I was talking to one of my friends who grew up in the UK. And he says his problem with Stand By Me, which is my favorite Stephen King story, is that he doesn't relate to the kids. So I say, what do you think about it? He goes, again, these aren't my rituals. This isn't how I grew up. These weren't things that I did with my group of friends. And I went, holy shit, that's my problem. I didn't do these things. My parents had a business. We traveled every weekend. Every weekend I was in a different state. At most, I would see like this kid I saw last year, right? I had friends, but they were at school. And at the end of the school day, we went our separate ways. During the summer, I might see them once if somebody had a birthday party. I didn't grow up with this. I don't identify with it. Um, the reason that I came to the conclusion that Stand By Me is important to me is once I got to about 14, 15, somewhere in there, that's when I got my core group of friends that I spent all of my time with. And I overcompensated. I was never alone. I'm an only child. I went out of my way to never be alone for like three years, right? And, and Stand By Me really reflects that point of my time, even though they're younger than I was. I feel like it, the characters don't feel as old as they do in Stand By Me, even though they're supposed to be the same age. Okay. And so I feel like I relate to one and not the other. And I noticed with it, I've always loved the adult side. I love how trauma followed them, how it infects every piece of their life, how it affects their relationships, their decisions, their careers, and how when they come back, all this shit they've either A, forgotten, or B, pushed down to hide and ignore, comes flooding back. And, and I've been that fat kid that was held by bullies while one of them had a knife, right? And I push that out. But when I go home, when I go back to Lincoln, Nebraska, and I drive by my high school, that's the shit I think about. And it all comes flooding back. And I think that that's why I've always identified with the adult side of this. And so I want to I say all that because I want to know, did you guys grow up in a way that makes you like uh, – you know, really resonate with this film or not. I will, I will defer to the guest as I, as I work out my own trauma right now. <laughs> yeah. As uh, yeah, I, I think, you know what? I, I, I do think there's something to that for sure. And I would say I grew up much more like that. Uh, growing up, I grew up in Vermont and grew up in a, you know, a, a rural area in Vermont. And I would say, Really, we were at the the crest, or the or even the the final movement of the wave of uh, you know my parents just let us do what we wanted to do, and now in today as a parent, I'm like, what in the world were they thinking? Like that that is an insane parenting <laughs> philosophy. Like they just we would just my brothers, I had three brothers and I, we would just wander in the field and you know play near old wells and 
explore in the forest and and we would like build forts and and do that kind of thing it was very rural there you know you had to make your own fun and the parents were just <laughs> and not not to the extent of you know in the, in the it films the parents are so much of a background that it's clearly a problem right like the detachment and disinterest <laughs> oh, yeah. of the parents is a huge crisis from the very first sequence of the first film but it was, i'm not saying that my parents were negligent but it was a different world. It was a world where it was kind of like, you know what, walk down to Main Street and like go visit your friends, go do what you want and, you know, come back by dinner time. And it was a, it was a world that at least conceptually felt safe enough to do that. And so I guess I could I can relate to it more on the like kids wandering and making their own little universe for themselves. I can connect to that on a deeper level. But it's also it was the first book I read uh, the, my first Stephen King book, which is a crazy, like, who starts with it? I started with it when I was <laughs> young. I think I was maybe, I, I want to say like 10 or 11. And I read it, and it was so long, but it kept me interested for whatever, a thousand pages, 900 pages. And I remember just like I'm being amazed that a writer could keep me, a 10 or 11 year old boy, like really riveted to a story for that long. I mean, it was such a long story, the longest by at that point, the longest novel I'd read by far, right? Like it, it, it blew all the other novels out of the water for length. And I just couldn't get enough of it. I mean, I had to keep going with it. And so I think it was the first major novel I read that was so riveting and so captivating to me. That's why it maybe stuck with me forever is it's that first book that you just fall in love with and realize, wow, this guy can write and he definitely can pull me in in a way that at that at that point not a lot of the young adult literature that I was reading was uh was having that same effect so I think on both counts I'm just the perfect audience for for it nice okay. what about you Don all right I grew up <laughs> not too different than you did James um only I wasn't going places on the weekends it was because my parents were in the military my mom was in the military as I was growing up um you know we change locations you know uh, every couple of years sometimes at, at at the shortest every six months um so you know i've spent time in in colorado and in indiana germany um louisiana and in and, and eventually mississippi and georgia so i i went to all these places and 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 in those formative years and the same years as we we would associate with the kids were where they were junior high high school so my my early, I would probably say my early part of the childhood uh, up to the point where I was almost 10, I was in Colorado, then came down to Mississippi. And, and there were friends I had to find, if that makes sense, because a lot of the people I was associating with in a lot of cases, if they weren't military kids, like when I was in Colorado or uh, even some of the ones when I was in Indi Indiana, like you already had your established group of friends. It was hard to break through into you know, into those peer groups and, and make those friends uh, because, you know, being the new kid wears off pretty, pretty quickly. And, and so for me, I really, I really associated with Ben like way too much where it's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm new. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to make friends and, you know, I'm a little chubby. So you know, I'm going to go do my own shit. I'm going to go read. I'm going to go play some video games. I'll, I'll just be by myself. But I definitely had those times with, with my cousins growing up where I would go visit them during the summers and we did all this shit. We'd go ride bikes, you know, uh, ride the go-karts on the farm, go out into the woods, you know, basically just get into general mischief where you weren't hurting anybody. It was just like, hey, let's just go play around in the woods, you know, pretend, you know, G.I. Joe or or whatever, you know, we're just going out there and having fun. But, you know, there there were some there were some things that some associations that you make at the that at that at that age group uh, that do stay with you. Uh, to, to the point where, you know, a couple of the cousins that I have, like, you know, if they were to, we, we could honestly feel like we were kids by sitting around and, 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 you know, just BSing. Uh, we could talk about something that took place like 30 years ago as if it was yesterday. And so that's kind of the, the fun thing about that. So for me, this was a, a, a cool nostalgia movie, but not just for nostalgia's sake, uh, for nostalgia's sake. But also for the fact that 
it makes you remember those good things from your childhood or from your past. And in a sense, they almost make you avoid the bad stuff, or at least the, the ter- traumatic or terrifying stuff that you may have gone through, which was a, whether it was intended or not, it was a kind of a, a, a good thing as an audience member to get into where you start focusing on all the good stuff, but then all this traumatic stuff happens to kids and you question like, shit, yeah, there was that one time that this happened. Or there was this one time where, in my case in high school, where I ate the same exact lunch every day because I did not want to go to the lunchroom and have to deal with, you know, any of the bullies or anything that was going on. So I had a banana nut muffin that I picked up from Dunkin' Donuts every day of my senior year. I picked it up in the morning and that was my lunch every day uh, my senior year because I did not want to go to the lunchroom and I did not want to have to deal with being harassed or, or, or anything like that. I just... I either went to the library, you know, ate ate it on the way, or I went to the the journalism room and and ate while I was working on the school paper. So yeah, I definitely identify with Ben in 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 the uh, in the first chapter. Well, and in the second because your abs are amazing. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I just love the part where where Richie was like, "Hey, what happened to you?" I mean, like you're hot. <laughs> 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 pretty good looking in the in the grand scheme of things. This is a pretty fortunate group of friends in the looks department, right? Well, I, you know, I, I think we could start any number of different places. I mean, I find the the novel uh, to be really um, for me thought provoking on the grounds of like the ideas we're kind of talking about. We're we're already kind of talking about it, but the idea of community. Mm-hmm. And I think the genius of the novel is the way it holds intention. Like communities make us, but we also make communities. And the ways our communities defined, define who we are, define our like horizons of possibility, define us in ways that are really good, right? I mean, like community is the thing that saves them in the film and in the novel. But community is also the thing that can turn really ugly, right? I mean, it's the same group that can be uh, Henry Bowers forms his own community, and it's an ugly community, right? Like, community can be, even just the idea of community, of building a fort, is essentially saying, you can't come in to our fort. It's an exclusionary kind of thing. And so what I really appreciate about the novel is it wrestles with our own understandings of community as both the thing that really oppresses us and the thing that is our only hope. And so I, I feel like maybe the, the best place to begin with any discussion of it is with those kind of big picture questions about what is community? How do we understand our communities? How do we make them better? How do they destroy us and leave us, you know, uh, really fleeing for greener pastures? Um, I don't know that, that to me, that's the heart of, every iteration of it on some level. Don, do you have anything you want to say to that before I begin my long rant? Oh, please. Uh, well, I would say, you know, with respect to community, <laughs> you have the, the, the norms and mores. You, you've got the, the, the expected behavior. You've got the, the us versus them or us and the other. Unfortunately, sometimes with respect to community, what you see is people end up adopting too much of the community behavior or what the community expects out of them. And Richie, I I like to use as a perfect example, he's overcompensating with the jokes, the dirty language, all these things, because not, not just that that's his role within the group, but that's kind of what he expects the group to judge him based off of. Like, I have to be the funny guy. I have to, I have to talk about my penis. I have to talk about sex. I have to talk about having sex with your mom you know, because that's a way of protecting myself from any judgment that I would have of someone I was suspicious of at that same age, uh, to the point where, you know, this is a guy that grows up in the closet. And I guess the idea of him not knowing how to express his own sexuality or who he is, you know, really stood out to me. And it made me a little bit concerned about I guess because the the novel itself takes place in the 50s and, you know, they come back to the kids in the 80s. I I felt that, at least in the movie, that aspect of, of being comfortable with, with oneself or in one's skin, I think it, it, it would have been somewhat easier in the 21st century as opposed to 
you know, the 1980s. Like, I would have completely gotten it if it was if we did this movie where it was the 50s and the 80s, and it was still someone trying to struggle and all the all the different issues that uh, uh, get brought up in the 1980s revolving around the LGBTQ community. Um, but then, the, you know, it, it's you're still going to have people even to this day. I mean, here we are in 2021. Uh, there's still people struggling with their their sexual identity and their their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Um, so I just I just think it, it could have been handled differently, but it does demonstrate to you how he doesn't necessarily trust his friends enough with his own identity because he maybe he fears they won't be his friends anymore. So first, um, you know the the original story is the 50s and 80s. And I think it's way stronger because of that. And uh, and I feel like they just updated this to cash in on the nostalgia of the 80s and the whole Stranger Things kind of feel and and the, just everything that's happening, right? And I wouldn't have a problem with that if I felt that everything had been updated to reflect it. But I feel like they moved ages, or uh, not ages, decades, and then left everything the same. And, and I think that that comes through in what you just said. Like you, you felt it was weird that you know Richie can't do this when it's 2021. You know, and I'm not saying it's easy for anybody, but right, right, it, it should be easier for him than it is. His response feels very 80s to me. Right. And uh, and and I have a real issue with the shift because I feel like they didn't work hard enough to make it happen. With that said, I want to go back to communities for a second. Um, when I said I had a big long rant, that isn't really true, but there's a book that changed my life. It changed how I view everything. And, um, basically it's about communities and how they're not real. It's called imagined communities and it's a (laughs) Benedict Anderson. This book is the book I didn't want to read in college. I was like, Oh my God, what is this crap? And, and I preach it constantly. And the thing with uh, with imagined community is Anderson basically depicts that the nation is a socially constructed community imagined by people who perceive themselves as part of that group. I would argue that's bigger. I use this argument for religion. I use mm-hmm. it for uh, cities, towns, communities, uh, groups of friends. At the end of the day, the shit's made up. Somebody decided, this is the border of Nebraska. Let's make it weird looking. Somebody else said, my state's going to be a square, right? Like, <laughs> and, and none of it's real. And when we talk about evil caravans coming from the south to cross an imaginary fucking line, right? Like, we invest so much in these ideas and we want to be a part of this thing. And, and the way that this changed my life is I really started looking at how the rich have always used these imaginary communities to control us. And then I took that further and I started thinking about how we don't want to be alone. So we seek out people like us, right? So now we have a large group of people like us. Well, so in our group, we're like, but not those people. And we find a reason to section off half of them. And then we're like, oh, and we're different than these people because of this. And we just keep sectioning until we're fucking alone again. Humans are weird. But it proves that these communities don't matter. It doesn't matter if we're all Americans. Because we break it down by, oh, you're on the left and you're on the right. And you're this and you're black and you're white and you're whatever. And and it just makes me wonder what the hell a community is. And the only thing I can figure out is that it's just this agreed on thing that we're not going to be alone. And so I want to know what you guys think of that. Yeah, I think uh, the the novel and this is why, you know, I think the novel for me over the years has also I've gained appreciation for it because I think it handles these matters pretty deftly, especially in comparison to the films which I just don't see the same level of attention to some of these details. And, and admittedly, they can't do it. They got a thousand pages to cram into a, you know, an hour and a half film. It's a little difficult to include all the details. But in the novel, you know, I, I think King is really interested in, in just what you were saying. I mean, where how do we invent communities? How are communities these fictional constructions? And in this in the novel, 
King does this sort of, you know, postmodern meta thing where he's trying to say, we tell each other stories and storytelling becomes the real root of their community. And, and it becomes the thing like they have to get together and tell each other these stories. And it forms this imaginary community, just like Benedict Ander Anderson wants to talk about newspapers and, and all of the, you know, like the uh, mass printing press operations. He wants to say like the, the, the inauguration of those things really uh, brought us into what we now know as like nationalism. It brought us these borders that we hold to be so sacred. And on one hand, I really feel like King in his novel wants to explore, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And we have to remember, and I think that the film sort of gets at this, but a lot of what they have to do, they have to do alone. And so the film gives us the kind of like we all have to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and be a community. But it also tells us we all have to strike out on our own because that's how it finds us first. And we can't do it until we face it in, in as individuals. And so for me, like it's this really interesting interplay between the desire to be an individual, which means facing our own demons by ourselves, which means getting the hell out of Derry, to be right. frank, to be, which means yeah. like, I got to get out of this town and dust, get it like dust off my boots. And at the, on the, the same, like as part of that, it also defines us in a way that we cannot escape in the novel, Mike. And again, this would have been so much more interesting if Mike had been handled, not just as, uh, you know, the, the son of drug addicts, but had been handled more like from the, perspective of race if the if the film had really tried to take on the question of race more seriously i feel like mike is really interesting because when they come back in the novel mike says do you know why you're all rich and famous it's because of what happened here your yeah. your achievements are not your own the things that made you rich and famous didn't come from you and your own individual chutzpah it came because of this community and so you can't take the privileges that came with you without taking the responsibilities. Right. And so for me, like, it just opens up this big, comp like, interesting, complex way of saying, like, it, does my community imprison me? And at times it feels like it really does. Or is my community something that I can invent? And even if it is fantasy or fiction, it's a way of building something better, right? It's building a fort that we can all share and not be afraid. And so I, I just love the way the novel does not really stick with one or the other. It, it forces us to wrestle with the dynamic nature of all of it. Uh, and the film, let's just be honest, I mean, at least from my vantage point, the film just scratches the surface of that stuff. It just doesn't, a lot of that does not translate over. And one of the main reasons why in the second for me is when um, they add that subtext, not even subtext, of this oh, out in the open text of, you know what, these people, uh, if you don't kill Pennywise, you're going to die prematurely. That The subtext of like, you have to kill Pennywise or else you all are going to die premature deaths and it's going to be gruesome. That's the reason they all stick around in It Chapter 2. But it's like, that's not really in the novel and it kind of weakens, like, <laughs> don't you care enough about young kids and care enough about just general humanity do you really need that extra motivation to want to save yourself in order to come back and and save these other people it it gets rid of all of the broader sense of social obligation and just basically says you need to come back and save yourselves and in the end it co totally gets rid of the idea that they'd be doing something noble like maybe saving a stranger like maybe you should come back because even if you don't know these people you should want to save their lives uh, but all of that gets gets gone in in the films, and it, it just boils down to, you know, save your own hide. Yeah, and I think Bill is the only one that I recall who who makes a comment about, like, oh, we need to stop this from happening. I mean, Mikey definitely says it as well, but it seems like it hits Bill, especially when he goes back in, in the film, when he goes back at, by his house and runs into the same kid that was at the restaurant and... <laughs> Realize and he tells him like, "Hey, I don't care what you have to say to your parents." And it makes obviously makes no sense to the kid. It makes perfect sense to Bill, right? But says you need to get your family out of here. If you hear that sewer talking, don't you know? 
stay away, uh, stay away from the sewer. You know, it talks, whatever. And the kid's like, oh, you mean like the pipes in my house or the drains in my house? And it clicks in him. He's like, oh, shit, this kid has been visited by him already. And, you know, he's, he's you know, in lack yeah. of better term, he's, he's grooming him. He's getting him ready. Yeah. Um, to the point where you realize what it's really doing is it's it's Pennywise fucking with Bill more because it's like, I, not only am I going to do this, I'm going to do this while you watch and make you as yeah. helpless as you were when, you know, because, you, you know, you weren't there to save your brother. Now I'm going to show up. You're actually going to be there to watch this happen, but there's nothing you can do about it. But in, in response to the, the, the idea of community, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a great way to protect people or at least give you the illusion of it. And I, I love that two of you brought up, brought up magic communities because that's the one thing I've never understood. And I, and I think that's one of the problems I have with, you know, associating with big groups of people or, or just identifying myself in a certain way. Right. It's, I've never understood it. I was the kid in, in, in elementary, middle, and, and well, more so middle and high school that did not understand why the hell we were doing the Pledge of Allegiance, that didn't understand why we were standing when the flag, uh, I'm sorry, when the national anthem was playing. And, you know, I, I got into some heated arguments with people before about, like, why? I'm like, well, aren't you proud to be an American? I was like, I don't know what the hell that means. Yeah. Like, you're America, and, and, and especially this past year. When it comes down to just American identity, if you ask different groups of people what it means, you're going to get so many different answers. And then when you subdivide those groups, you know, if we're talking about race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, any of that, you're going to get different responses when you subdivide those groups based off of what that identity is. Uh, even, even if it comes to, like I said, if it goes back to something like patriotism or, or American, like, when I go abroad, and I know this is kind of the asshole thing, when I go abroad, the only time somebody knows I'm an American is when I pull out my passport. And it it came from this point of almost being embarrassed by the stereotypes and generalizations and a lot of things that were going on, especially in the post-9-11 world with Americans going places. Um, it just became this thing where I was like, no, I don't, I do not call me that. Do not. As opposed to how... Prior to that, if you were if you were black, you almost wanted to be treated that way because and I'm, I'm going to use James Baldwin as an example, because you're not treated like an American at home. But when you go abroad, people treat you better because you're an American. And he stated how he was subject to so much racial gen, uh, discrimination as well as as, as uh, discrimination based off his sexual orientation. And, but when he went to Europe, like it wasn't an issue. Because they didn't see him that way. They didn't see him as something that was different. And he got to become part of a community that he was rejected from at home. But he becomes part of that community in a new country. And gets to experience, I guess, the, the privileges or the honors, the distinctions that come with that, uh, the, 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 the attachment to that community. Um, so I think one of the great things about this film, when they're talking about or at least exploring community or exploring identity, it's that it's not always clear for the people that are part of those groups what it means. You know, when they are the losers or create that group known as the losers, it you know, there's somewhat clear and defined rules about who they are and the fact that, you know, they all suck. There are people that don't want them around. You know, they found this this bond between each other. But even as 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 time goes by, they don't necessarily know what that means. Yeah, and I think, you know, the there's unquestionably the idea that um, community brings violence, right? I mean, community mm -hmm. um, community feeds on violence. What is Pennywise if not the embodiment of like a provincial backwater burg that is violently expelling anything that is alien from its midst, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it is that kind of white supremacist. And again, the the novel talks about that in much more detail talks about like, you know, the, the black club that was burned down in Derry uh, talks about the long history of white supremacy in Derry. And all of that gets kind of lost in, in the film. It, it's only there as a subtext, but it's really important to remember, of course, that community requires violence. And so, you know, it's, it's not some romantic thing that we should all cling to. Nostalgia can be toxic because, 
it's like, man, our communities are just these fortified, uh, you know, areas that, that block out people who might need our help. But also, I think in it, there is this focus on infrastructure mm. and the fact that we spend so much time in the sewers and the barrens uh, of dairy and also in the public library. We spend a lot of time in places that are supposed to be like public common space, areas that are built up to help to provide resources or, or distribute resources a little bit more equitably among members of a community. The, the ways that we have built communities to protect each other and to supply us with things like water and, and sewage and, and so on and so forth with, with education, with you know the library and all of its uh, information that his armed Ben with uh, and prepared him to go to battle. I mean, if he wasn't spending so much time in that public library, they wouldn't have known what to do or even what was happening. Right. So there is that, I think, positive view of community. It isn't just like a total pipe dream. It isn't just them having like the blood brother ceremony with each other, uh, which all gets kind of silly and, you know, uh, over the top. There is this under the surface when the camera is kind of, you know, flying down those large cauldrons and taking us into the labyrinth of the sewer. It's like, this is what community is too. Community is where we, we have a, a built shared experience. It's the stories and the ways that we, uh, you know, build each other up that is important. And if we neglect that, as we're seeing in Texas at this very moment, if you neglect to take care of that public um, obligation to make sure that we all have running water and that we're not left to freeze to death by ourselves or, or not left with no water, not left to like fend for ourselves. If we don't have that, uh, we end up facing Pennywise alone. So I, right. I do think the text has some upbeat attitudes about uh, community. I just actually think the novel does a better job defending community. Oh yeah. The, the, the film doesn't, Ultimately, I think you're kind of like, why don't you people just like go your separate ways? Like, what what is it that, you know, if you could just get rid of each other, the like fuzzy ending where they're riding bikes and like looking out windows into the sunlight. And like, I think I figured out how to write my ending to my book. And it's like, man, this stuff is so corny. Like the end the ending is so like hitting you in the head with a hammer. Uh, It's way too saccharine sweet for my taste. And I just feel like the novel is way more compelling and interesting when it comes to what are the redeeming features of, of community. Mm-hmm. I, I want to talk about the, the not writing a good ending thing really fast. Cause this is one of my biggest pet peeves in part two. And, and again, like, you know, King makes his cameo. He even has the license plate from Christine on the wall behind him, which was a nice touch as well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if it had just been this scene, like, you know, your endings kind of suck. That would be funny. <laughs> okay. That would be hilarious. Um, also, while talking about him, there was originally supposed to be a scene from him in the past, and he would have been played by Joe Hill, his son. So that would have made me happy because I'm a huge Hill fan. <laughs> right. But uh, yes, you right. anyway, it, it would have been funny if it was once. It's the fact that it's drilled in everywhere. Everything is, you don't know how to write an ending. You don't know how to do this. So, hey, writers, hey, King, let me tell you how to end this. You ready? Bill makes the kill. And Beverly looks at him and says, now that's a good ending. <laughs> right. That would have yeah, been that's, a good That's how you fucking do it. It's not hard, guys. Somebody give me King's paycheck because I just fixed this. <laughs> yeah. But, uh... <laughs> But uh, some of the other stuff that bothers me is so little and so tweaky. And it comes back to how you were talking about, I, I don't remember if this was off air before we started or on this episode, so I apologize. But we were talking about King being kind of problematic with race and LGBTQ and everything else. And I think Mike is a really good example of this because Mike ends up in the library and in the book... Mike is the the glue that holds this together. Mike is what makes the structure fantastic in the book. Again, not a fan of the plot, but I love the structure of the book. Um, and and I feel like Mike should have been the one in the library learning everything. 
I don't feel like a new kid moves to town and wants to learn the history of the town. That's weird to me. And I feel like it just becomes cute white kid that we all want to identify with. Let's make him the smart hero. And, and I feel like Mike would be so much stronger if Mike had been the one. And then that influences his life and he stays in the library because that's how he saved his friends. Okay. But I think they do. They, they deal with that issue. I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I think the way they deal with it so ineffectively too, is the way that they, you know, the, the things that draw them together, which should be so captivating, like how Mike becomes a part of their group because they all like defend him within, in the rock fight. Yeah. Uh, the, the larger issues at play, like with, in the second film, uh, when we're talking about Richie's sexuality, these are opportunities to really get into some stuff. Like that's where friendship and community becomes really important. Like, are you willing to defend the vulnerable? Are you willing to right. welcome them? Are you willing to actually accept them for who they are? And yes. instead of instead of digging that should in, be the end. Yes. Instead of digging into that, they really just like do it lip service. And strip away all of the complexity and depths of these characters and leave them just kind of like fulfilling token roles. And and so I just never he doesn't end with like this big here's how we deal with disenfranchised people in our community. Here's how we welcome them. Here's how we get stronger. It just never can never reach those heights for me because it doesn't do the work. It, it doesn't put in the effort to make that thing pay off. I just I really believe that them confronting their fears to each other should be how you beat it. It should yeah. be that absolute support system for each other. Like, we know you're gay. Maybe we don't know who you're in love with. Maybe that's the big reveal, right? But we know you're gay, and we love you for it, and that's great. And we know that you lost your parents, and we love you, and we know you were sexually abused, and we love you. Yes. And those fears and that support should be what beats it. And instead, the message is... You want to beat a bully? All you got to do is be a bigger bully and bully the bully to death. Right. Then when he's a little tiny baby, when he's the most vulnerable, reach in and pull out his fucking heart and squish right. it. Yeah. It what is, the it's, fuck kind of message is that? The, the logic the logic is from Mike when he's slaughtering the lambs, right? Like, don't be the the one who's slaughtered be the one who slaughters and you're kind of like okay so when in the movie is that logic going to be debunked but it never gets debunked because as you're suggesting that's actually the like that is actually the message of this movie like become the one who slaughters don't be the one who gets slaughtered yes. that's ultimate and that's a very troubling conclusion and i don't think that's the conclusion that the novel had and i don't think it's a conclusion that any of us would feel <laughs> super comfortable with but let's just say this like for me here's why i think the ending thing if, if you could and there's a lot of meta horror stuff we can talk about the many references to other stephen king plots of course and it, it becomes this like which all stephen king adaptations now are like these meta commentaries about other stephen king films yes. which can get kind of tiresome like okay we're in a horror movie i get it there's a lot of meta stuff okay so th there's a lot of that here and i and okay that's that's fine i'm not you know it's not necessarily doing it for me but i can see why some people might appreciate like the references to carrie and to the shining and all that other stuff that's coming up um but ultimately i think the message that is effective is we never really truly end this right like you never actually end your fears it's kind of that whole logic of addiction itself like you're never yep. cured of addiction you just simply try to handle it you're just like always doing work with yourself and with your people to try to just make it right and so to me the idea that you ever kill it is stupid you're never going to kill yes. it that that like defeats like the idea that you just be like you're all grown up and so you don't have fear anymore that's ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. And like, like every 27 years, it's going to come back. Right. And so instead of trying to resist that and to say, let's try to put an end to it. So the audience will be happy. How about you let that be part of the message? The fact that like you need community for exactly that reason, it's going to keep repeating itself. Like you think you've got your stuff handled, but next year, maybe you won't next year. There's a pandemic and you're staring out the window into the void and you're like, uh Oh, I don't think I have my stuff figured out anymore and we all like that's an ongoing project that doesn't ever end and so i don't know for me i would have felt it to be much more 
effective if it just realized like the need for happy endings or the need for satisfying endings is a contrived need. We don't actually need it to end. We we can just be okay with handling our business together and just staying in touch and and trying to deal with it on an ongoing basis. Like why why would that be a bad ending? Yeah, that would be so good. Is, I would like this. I think the problem is in I I've I learned this from some friends of mine years ago who were international students or, or, um, or just, and some of my friends who watched a lot of just foreign movies, especially when it was horror movies, they said that the, the happy ending thing is, is something that has just been so ridiculously used and overused within American films. Whereas Mm -hmm. a lot of foreign films, the, you know, a lot of endings are ambiguous. Some are bad. Some, some are happy, but it doesn't become a trope where, Oh, the killer's dead. Yay. We can go about our lives. And 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 I have to agree, the 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 idea that in the second film you get an understanding that the further away that they'd gotten from Derry, or just getting out of Derry, all the 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 members of the losers club, besides Mikey, of course, because he stays, they've all forgotten what took place until he calls them. And then there's kind of like, oh shit, I feel I feel scared. I feel some fear. You know, Richie throws up. And, you know, the people that are with him think it's like pre-show jitters, but it's it's he's he's feeling all, you know, it, it, subconsciously there's something there. And as they return, they start to remember things. And, and that one uh, line that always sticks with me is like, I'm remembering stuff that I didn't even know I forgot. It's a and, great line. Yeah. And it's it's just it's it's one of those things that you you have or one of the great lines in this film that makes you think beyond the film. Whereas there are things in, in all of our lives that we've suppressed, we've pushed down, we've we've tried not to think about, but it doesn't go away. I mean, it 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 just stays dormant. I mean, there's there's stuff from my childhood and, and everybody's childhood for that matter, where if there's gonna be something that's gonna trigger it and you're gonna think like, oh fuck, I forgot all about that. Like, you know, I've I told James about the first time I saw, or I shouldn't say the first time I saw, because it sounds like they've been multiple times you always do that i saw like what are the others (laughs) well i should say the first brutal attack not the first murder because i've seen like stuff take place like fights and and you know people get hit by cars and stuff like that but you know i was like three and i saw this guy and these and these women fighting over a machete and this was when i was i'm assuming it was a machete but because there was blood everywhere but there are some times where i think about that and and realize like I've never handled that shit. Like as a three year old, I didn't understand what was going on. But you know, there there are traumatic events that take place with people, whether it's you know sexual assault, violence, uh, I mean, physical violence, uh, uh, psychological abuse, you know, car accidents, acts of terrorism. Where you know we we get so stuck in telling people like, oh, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of that. You should get over it. It's not possible. Like, how are you supposed to get over something a, a traumatic event? that had such a big effect on you, uh, you know, besides, you know, suppressing it with medication, therapy, things like that. I mean, it, it's treatable, but, but fears not curable. Yeah. No, I mean that, that, I think that's the, that's the take home message. I think of, of it, I mean, or it should be, it, it's not the message, but it should be is, is that fear isn't curable. I mean, I, I like, I like phrasing it like that because, there, there's no world in which you can purge yourselves of what it represents. Right. And the only thing you can do is build up an infrastructure, an emotional, intellectual infrastructure, which is like every generation forgets that generations have been through this, right? Like it's happening right now with COVID. It's like this isn't the first time human beings have ever dealt with disease. You know, you know there have been pandemics mm-hmm. throughout history, right? But people are like – no one in no one's ever been through what we've been through. It's like, listen, you have to understand, <laughs> like, like the reason we have books and the reason we have schools and the reason we have these <laughs> things built up over time is like so that we can teach the people who forget because every generation is starting with a blank slate. Right. You got to remember that there's a way we can pass down the wisdom that we've accrued. Like, that's the beauty of Google. The uh, the ultimate community here, where we can like the, here we have access to the the wisdom and learning of generations of people compiled into one easy to access place, and like that's what community can do. But community can't 
solve all of our problems. Right. Community can't, you know, like wipe all of that clear, but community can provide us with the tools we need to keep up the fight and, and to keep recognizing that you can't cure it, but you can treat it. There is a way to, you know, be armed and be ready and to be handling it and looking introspectively that, you know, uh, at least allows you to cope, like just provides us with some coping mechanisms mm -hmm. for the fact that fear does not get purged from us no matter what. Like if, if there's any larger lesson from horror as a genre, it's, it's the image of uh, Michael Myers no longer on the ground and, you know, he could be anywhere. It, it's the recognition like, listen, there's so many sequels because fear doesn't stop. It just right. keeps on going. Better to just like figure out how you're going to cope with that reality and, and move ahead. I, I really like that the the fear can't be cured should be the message of this. Because you could even, you could go a step further and say that, you know, the support of your friends is the gazebo effect. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> gazebo just really cracked me up in this. But uh, no, I, I feel like this whole film would be so much stronger with messages like that. I feel like that's why it doesn't work. It's like, it's like what I was saying about insomnia or on guns. King presents all these arguments and then doesn't take a stand. And and I don't know if it's like that in the novel. I read it the first time when I was like 14 and then I tried to read it when I was 30 and I threw it across the room and that I never <laughs> went back. But I, I don't know if that's the same message in the book. So I'm judging solely off these movies. I just feel like that that ending isn't there because he didn't take a stand on how we should feel. I don't know. Um, I want to go back to something else, though. I was talking about Mike and how I felt like this thing that should have been for his character was given to Ben. I have another one. There's a it, it's kind of along the lines of Chekhov's gun, right? Like the first time we see Mike, I don't know the name for this thing. So he has the, the sheep shooter in his hand. <laughs> yeah. And he can't pull the trigger, right? Any fucking writer who knows anything about writing knows Mike has to use this at some point and he has to make the kill, right? The time that it should be Mike's turn to pull it is given to Bill in the film. I don't know if yeah. it's like that in the book because like I said, I didn't, I, I haven't read it in forever. But that no, really all that, bothered all me. All that stuff with the bolt gun and in the flooded basement, none of that's in the novel. That's all okay. film, film stuff. Okay, so I won't blame King. I'll blame the the film writers. Like, how do you take this moment that is so clearly built for Mike? Mm -hmm. Like, he should he should have a moment where the door opens and the charred bodies are coming for him, and he has to use it. You know, yeah. something. And instead, Bill has it for no fucking reason at all. And and I hate that so much. And I just feel like Mike kept getting neutered throughout this. Every story Mike should have had was given to someone else. I will say, while we're on the subject of uh, support of your friends, I, I've been Ben. I've been the fat kid with a bunch of skinny friends, right? This kid, and I mean the actor as well, this kid is brave as fuck. Standing out there in your tidy whities with these other kids your age in their tidy whities and you look the way you do when they look the way they do, I couldn't have fucking done it. He already feels so supported by these guys. He's not bothered by it in the slightest bit. He's standing out there in the sunshine, smiling, ready to do this. And I think that you could take that moment and and you could take other moments like that and show this support of this group of friends and you could really use that for the ending that we've been talking about that we would prefer oh how how about the uh the bridge the carving on the bridge thing which i think they do some interesting and nice work with like having uh bowers cutting the h yeah. uh, on to ben and then later using you know carving the names and like i i think there's some interesting setup stuff they're doing there but the question i have is like why does Richie, who again, like, you, why even keep this? I read an interview with Bill Hader and they were just like, yeah, we, we wanted it to be kind of implied, but we didn't want to go all in on it. It's like, well, just go all in on it. Why, why does this yeah, have right. to be delicately? And <clears throat> the fact that in the end, he goes to carve and he carves his friend's initial. Now, the question for me is like, why can't Bill Hader 
find love or find like, why can't, why can you not let his moment of like fulfillment be something that's meaningful to his own, like the thing he's been grappling with in the film, which is his sexuality. On some level, that's the thing that's been his most feared thing is his revealed of his sexuality. And in the end, like all you get is like fraternal love. You get like, he, he gets to have affection for his buddy because I don't think there's anything to base like that they had a relationship that was right. like not platonic. No, it so, feels so, completely like a crush that he never got to admit. Right. So he goes to the to the bridge and he's like, my buddy died and he, and he gets carves in the, you know, uh, R plus E. And it's just kind of like, man, it doesn't feel like this character's journey was leading to a kind of like platonic. No, this was this was my buddy. I'm sorry I lost my friend kind of thing. Like, why couldn't you take his story to its actual natural sort of conclusion. Well, and, and everything with this, because I watched, I read spoilers for everything I knew before this even started that they did this Richie storyline. Right. And it's so much stronger. If his friends know, like you get this great scene where he's crying in the river or lake or whatever that is crying in the water and and his friends are all like, you know, we get it, man. But you don't. You think that it's the same as you. You think, oh, your friend died. Or like, you know, groups of friends always have a couple that are best friends in there, right? right. So like, maybe they're like, oh, he was your best friend. We get it. But they don't. They yeah, don't right. get it. And if he had had to come forward with his fear and confront it and be supported by them, if even if like as... Uh, Eddie was dying if he had confessed it then like I love you I've always loved you like you know yes something like that and everyone else heard it like even that would make this moment where they're all holding him so much more powerful this this is like I think to me that's it like that's the that right there is encapsulates the biggest problem with the the film adaptations is it's just like you could have, instead of uh, going for laughs and have Eddie's wife be the same actress that played his mother, right? Oh and like, God, yeah. and like, okay, haha, like that—that's a, a short one-off laugh. Instead of doing that, how about you do explore the relationship between Eddie and Richie and make it something that is meaningful or substantive? Like, give them something to really cry about. Give them something to re- like. But they're so afraid to do that. <clears throat> and again, I think I'm really interested in the fact that why this film is so hesitant to face the, in, the demons, like it's guilty of the thing it's supposed to be criticizing because it will not face the demons that it's just teasing to the surface, right? Like it won't face racism with Mike. It has to turn Mike's issue into his parents being drug addicts. It yep. has to take uh, Richie and turn him into you know, something closeted, but really never explicitly making that clear, never adding the, never making those stakes real in a human way, but making it a very like lip gloss kind of like, okay, we talked about sexuality. It it was there in the subtext. You can't blame us. So how about you make these characters more three dimensional and give them more kind of meat on the bone here. And I, I would have really liked that if they could have explored those characters in greater detail but so often what they went with instead is the laugh I mean, instead what they would go they're happy to go with is eddie and like isn't it funny that his wife is his mother right. like all of that kind of stuff they just always prefer the cliche over taking a risk which is weird because it's a movie all about how people have to take risks to form communities and they have to like you know put themselves out there and make themselves vulnerable. And here this film will not really, will not really go to war against the things that it's talking about. And so it ends up being a very neutered and in in my opinion, just kind of weakened story as a consequence of that. So I, I feel like if I was writing this, you know, that scene where Beverly and Ben are together and and she starts telling him, I could never love a fat kid like you. And and she's Pennywise, right? And that whole scene, I would do that with Eddie and Richie instead. I would have the two grown adults walking somewhere. And all of a sudden, Eddie's like, are you looking at my ass? And he's like, what? what? And he's like, are you, are you looking at me? Like, what's wrong with you? You know? And like, I would have used that and just hit that Richie fear. Yes. Like, 
I would have capitalized on it 100%, but like I, I would have cashed in on that 100%. And that's so much stronger than anything they did. And no. even if you like, I don't know, even if you, if you didn't fully uh, show everybody, it would give it to the audience. And then that subtext would affect everything else. But the, the film is, is more than happy, right? They offload that to Henry's cousin, right? right. In, in the video arcade, which is kind of like, again, why don't you give this thing some teeth? Uh, as you're yeah. suggesting, James, and let it be one of the relationships that matters in the movie. But also the, the way that the movie is willing, and I guess this is maybe a larger commentary about Hollywood generally, but the, the film shows absolutely no hesitation to show in graphic detail the maiming and murder of children and disenfranchised minorities. It has no qualms with showing a very bloody and brutal attack on a gay man in the second film. Right. The camera's willing to like go all in on that, but it can't go all in on the Richie sexuality. It can't it can't let him say the word "I'm gay" out loud in the in the film, but it can show Adrian's face like pummeled and covered in blood. And it's just like. You don't understand that the way in which this film has perpetuated the thing it, it is most fighting against, because it is totally leaning on cliche and violence, the kinds of symptoms of, you know, a, a diseased society and is not willing to escape from that, which would be to have these people actually make themselves vulnerable to one another and then protect each other on those terms. But instead, all they get is cookie cutter 80s nostalgia friendship, which is just where we cleaned up a bathroom together. <laughs> and, like, and that suffices for like, what is their main bonding as, as people? It is they all helped her to clean up her bathroom while a song from The Cure was playing. Like that is that's the extent of like, this is how these friendships became solidified. So I just think it's, it would be more interesting to me if these were not just caricatures of teenagers from the 80s not just like you know when eddie calls uh bev molly ringwald like instead of making this a a derivative thing from 80s teen movies really really give it some stakes like make these people have relationships with each other that evolve over time and and i think it would just be more successful and we would care more we would care more when one of them was endangered or we would feel higher highs when they, you know, bail each other out if these relationships actually meant anything at all. Going back to R plus E on the bridge, how cool would it have been if during the kid part, during the, the second movie, we keep seeing R plus E anytime anybody's on the bridge. And at the end, Richie went back and carved their full names. Right. Yeah. Like that'd be, that'd that would good. mean something. Yeah, that, that would, would that mean would something, you know, like, yeah. yeah. Anyway, sorry, Don, I didn't mean to cut you oh, off. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Um, but, but yeah, the, you've got a, at least, you know, you, you talk about the violence uh, towards the, the couple at the beginning of, of It Chapter 2. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're equally, I guess the, the filmmakers are equally gratuitous of, of, you know, even Beverly's thing, you know, showing the, the, the pharmacist. Well, not as far as with violence, but as far as how creepy men are, and, and especially the the pharmacist um, trying to, I guess, curry favor with Beverly, who's obviously a child. I mean, it's not like you know she she's I don't know is appears older and she just happens to be younger. You know, where he's like, oh my god, I didn't know you were sixteen, seventeen. Oh, I'm so I should have never said something like that to you. She's obviously a child, and the and the pharmacist is sexualizing her roughly in the same way that her father is. And it's it's I, I thought it was something good to explore, and I'm glad they didn't go too far with it. I think it was fine as, as far as the the level of, of of inappropriateness was there for you. You saw how creepy the 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 pharmacist was, and it makes you think about how creepy men are in general. Uh, as far as boundaries with women or in, in the case of this pharmacist, how, how creepy they are with the boundaries of children uh, to, to present themselves that way or think it's okay to talk to a child in a sexualized way. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and what does it say that the film was more willing, I would argue, more willing to 
flirt with the boundaries of child molestation, mm-hmm. which happens with multiple characters, more willing to like go up right to that line than it was with LGBT issues. Like it, it's it's more willing to do that than to acknowledge that this is you know that actually like look at the face of what sexuality means uh, in a healthy human sort of way here or to talk about like systemic racism or any of those kinds of things rather right. than like really lift the the gate and show the ugliness of dairy. It is much more comfortable, like the just general creep outs, right? The, the cliched creep outs. And it's more comfortable, with, frankly, with showing children almost being molested than it is openly speaking about some of those social ills that are clearly there, right? There's so much Mm -hmm. there for them to do with it and they just completely repress it. And in the end, we don't get to deal with any of that stuff. Yeah. The only thing I I would, I would say that they do, or at least with with Beverly's character, especially when, you know, Jessica Chastain is, is assuming the role that they kind of allude to how the abuse of her childhood leads to her being in an abusive relationship or abusive relationships. And, I I watched it again yesterday, and I don't think there's ever a moment where she handles that other than, you know, beating up her husband or her then husband, who is who's obviously been abusing her, but beating him up so she can leave. Um, but there's there's no other empowerment where it's it's like I need to th- I need to think about myself or take care of myself. Even you know we want Ben to get the girl, we want her to end up with Ben, but there should also be that moment where she kind of thinks like. Or at least faces that issue, uh, aside from you know the the trauma that her father caused. But I, I would have loved to have seen further exploration of of, of Richie and Eddie. Yeah. Uh, but I think the problem that 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 the filmmakers may have been, I guess, thrust upon them, is that fear of well, what if we get it wrong? And I'm of the I'm of the mindset that if you get it wrong, you at least did something. Yes. Here it's you didn't do anything. Take, like a, you, take a risk, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could have... There's got to be someone you could ask, hey, well, did yeah, we get this it, right? Yeah. But even then, even then, sometimes the people that you ask might have been wrong about, you know, how it's presented, where, you know, you and I, James, we talk about, we run ideas off each other with with, with respect to things. We talk to people uh, periodically about, you know, getting things better represented. And then sometimes it's, you know, well, don't worry too much about that. No one's really going to see it that way. Oh, don't think about it this way because then you're overthinking and you you might end up making a trope or or a char- character generalization. And at the time of when this film would have been released in in what 2019, if they'd done yeah. that, maybe in 5, 10 years from now somebody would look back and said, "No, they could have handled it handled it it better." As opposed to now where we're already saying, "You should have done something. You should have yeah. shown some aspect of of uh, of Richie or even Eddie." Because you're right, the 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 joke about oh he married a woman that looks just like his mother, and then while he's driving, you know he's saying goodbye to her. He says uh, goodbye mom or goodbye yeah. mother or whatever, and um, it it lets you know okay we're trying to be funny about this when we could have done something else. Because you get these moments where Eddie and Richie while they're hanging out while they're getting back together, you know as far as hanging out with one another after all these years, that there's something there. And as a viewer, as somebody who is looking for a lot more depth in this film, as opposed to, you know, your general horror, uh, general horror or general slasher films, you have the time to do this. You had a three hour sequel. You you have the time to do this. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, what you ends, had the opportunity to do it. You know, what ends up happening is I feel like and this is maybe, a, you know, true of a lot of horror films, I, I feel like that just kind of fall short is it, it doesn't really do it doesn't really honor the promise of dealing with uh, psychological trauma. It, it doesn't actually mm-hmm. want to go there. And so, you know, whereas it could have dealt with people's real hangups, right. Or people's real struggles psychologically, instead of doing that, it is much more comfortable kind of doing this very cliched, you know, all the stuff with Bill and his guilt and and that stuff it would, you know, he's got the puppet at the end and like I think they're thinking that this is revelatory, right? Like, isn't it amazing? Like, a guy, this guy's dealing with the fact that he's repressed something. It's like, yeah, that's the entire genre. Like, right. there's no you're not doing anything <laughs> new by being like, hey, this guy has a problem with his past. It's like, no kidding. You've got to 
uh, you can actually try to explore it if you treat these people like characters and not like cliches, not like they are caricatures. And I feel like the film actually cashes out on that stuff and swaps it for Cabin in the Woods style a uh, self uh, meta critique about the genre when it starts getting into, you know, this is a, a movie within a movie within a movie. This is all about these horror cliches and all of that stuff is just been done to death. Like I just would prefer if they had come out and treated the problem as being interesting, even if you want to treat it as being, let's say, how trauma can be repetitive, right? right? Instead of even conveying that to me, honestly, I felt often, more often, as though it was just redundant. Like the movie, I was like, yeah, he already dealt with Georgie. Why are we dealing with Georgie again? He already, like, in the first movie, we dealt with Georgie. And I get, like, the point of it is that trauma never goes away, that it stays with you. But as we've already said, like, they're not honoring that premise if it's true that it never goes away then you should have that should be the theme of the movie but to me it just came across as like they're trying to do all this very stylized these little moments that were highly stylized but in the end i'm just kind of like how many times does bev have to kick her dad in the crotch like does that have to happen like six times in the two movies before it's like i think she's come to terms with it uh, I just, to me, it just often felt repetitive in a way that you could have done productively, but was just ultimately disappointing. Okay. I would have liked to see Bev, like, not necessarily single, but like in an okay relationship when she's older. And I would like her to tell the other boys that they're the reason why. Right. Like, yeah. like she learned that, that she doesn't have to deal with this and she doesn't have to stick up for it. And here's my reasoning. My reasoning is that I spent four years as a case manager for women who have been abused and you don't just get up and leave. You just don't. You either plan for ages to escape or you stay or you take the clothes on your back one night and you make a break for it. But it doesn't play out the way Bev leaves. You don't go, I got a phone call. I'm going to go see my friends. Peace out, loser. Yeah. Like it, there's nothing about this scene that's real for me and it made me immediately not like Chastain's character. And that's not yeah. her fault, but like I just I couldn't get into Bev at that point. And I think Bev is probably the strongest character in the first one. I yeah. I don't know the name of the actress that played her, but I really liked it other than she reminded me of Pennywise too many times. And that was kind of weird. Yeah. But <laughs> like set, starting it this way. And it was the same with the mini series. Like I just, I never bought this. I, yeah. I don't get how I'm supposed to believe she's in this horribly abusive relationship. And then she's like, Hey, taking a vacation with like six guys. Can't tell you about it. Gotta go. <laughs> no. Well, and and I think, you know, and again, it sounds like I'm like, you know, uh, really championing the novel here a lot. Like, it sounds like I'm the novel's biggest fan here. No, and that's good because I haven't read it. So we get that that other side. The novel does include with her character, with with Bev in the, you know, when they're adults, the, the husband doesn't give up. Like the husband becomes part of like, it's not just Henry Bowers who comes back to get them. Her husband like keeps tracking her down throughout the the novel and won't leave her alone. And like so like you can't just like, you know, hit the the husband with a, a vase over the head and then run out and be done with it. Like he, he's like, he, well, I guess she's gone. He becomes like the the most terrifying. <laughs> you know, he's like perpetually haunting her. Right. Like you, you can't just leave your abusive husband and think that he's like and not be afraid of him finding you not be afraid of him like you know he he persists and like it includes one of bev's other friends who talks about like feminism and and like there's these layers to bev's evolution that make again in the novel it feels like the payoff is earned like when she finally does come like realize who she is and, and realize her own strength it feels like she's really earned that growth like we've watched her go through some serious stuff uh but in the in the film as you're suggesting i feel like it's just like she's over it really early and and that's true of mike too if you think of it like mike doesn't seem to have the same trauma as anybody else like he's 
just like a typical Stephen King, quote unquote, magical Negro character who seems to have just transcended his own his own past when it comes to race and all these other kinds of like he's just doesn't go through it like everybody else does. And they just make him into uh, a stock character when I again, like his own personal history must have been a pretty interesting story to tell. Like he's the one who got left behind. He he's the one who's stuck in dairy with all these responsibilities, and somehow you take that character and make him just interchangeable. I mean, he, he's not actually that significant in in the grand scheme of the film. He's really not, and I I hate that so much. But um, I I feel like uh, the thing you were talking about with Bev's husband would be so strong, and it goes back to. My number one complaint with Pennywise, as well as the realism of Pennywise, and that is that the real world is fucking scarier. Yeah. Everything that these kids go through in their daily life, to me, is way scarier than this supernatural thing that might kill them. And my reasoning for that is if I'm a kid in Derry and I'm not picked, I still deal with all the other horrors. If I am picked... I can't do shit about it. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll be honest, man. I'm going out faster than Georgie did. I don't put up a fight. I'm, I'm, I suck at that kind of stuff. So, so I'm not scared of Pennywise. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't do anything for me. And that's another reason that I don't connect with this. I don't feel like he's scarier than the actual lives they're leading. Well, from a from a technical point point of view, you know what I felt was you know one of the great weaknesses of it, and this was true of the miniseries back in the day, uh, in the '90s as well, is an over reliance on special effects. Oh like my God, yes. the it's like why don't you? Pennywise is scarier if he's not so omnipresent. If it's like I don't get to see his creepy face every four seconds, I'm a little more creeped out if it's only occasional. And I got you got to give it to Muschietti. I think he does a pretty good job with the, he he he's good at that sty, those stylized scares. I mean, some of them are really pretty effective, but like why include the giant woman? Like it was creepy when Bev went to visit her apartment and they and Pennywise's daughter is kind of doing this like naked, weird, creepy thing in the background. Yeah, that was that way was, scarier. That, that was effective. And then it's like and then you turn her into a claymation giant who comes out like thumping around and you're like, is this scary? I, I was scared of the old woman when I didn't know what was going on. I was less scared when the old woman turned into this looming sci fi thing. And I was like, oh, okay, that, I mean, that just doesn't scare me. So I felt like he fell prey to making Pennywise a special effect. And like, here's all the cool ways we can use special effects to make him scary. And I'm I'm a sucker for the minimalist stuff. I'm a sucker if Pennywise is only very rarely glimpsed. Like, it, it just would have worked better for me without all of the excess of special effects that they tried to throw at him over the uh, course of the movies. What about you, Don? Were you scared of the naked woman running around? Uh, well, she didn't look like Blanche from uh, Golden Girl, so I wasn't necessarily paying that much attention to her. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I, I have to agree with you on this one, Mike. In the the whole idea that in the second movie, a lot of the power of, of, of Pennywise is taken away because he's there. That was a problem I had with it. I mean, it, cool. You know, I had some some great CGI kills and things like that. Some some great tension building moments. But the fact that I, I feel like Pennywise should have taken, uh, uh, I can't remember his name, but Skarsgård uh, should have taken top billing in this movie because he was there the most. Um, and I, I think the power from the first movie is you don't see him as often as you do in the second film. But the moments that you see him in the first film, they're typically good. I mean, even even the comedic, scary ones where he's uh, doing his little strut uh, yes. it, it, when, when Eddie's on the ground, when he's doing his strut. Yeah. I thought it was hilarious because, one, it looks funny visually. Yeah. But it's got to be fucking terrifying <clears throat> if that thing is coming after you. Yeah. And, and the fact that he's there and he can do whatever he wants. Um, but... That scene, I wish it had gone a lot differently because just 
just the moment where she's, you know, uh, what was the movie? Hereditary. Yeah. Uh, where Tony Collette's character, you immediately have this what the fuck moment where she's crawling on the ceilings. I was hoping for a moment like that with this movie where she cl- climbs up the wall, climbs on the ceiling, whatever, head rotates, looks back at her, and then speaks in the voice of Pennywise. And then Beverly's like, I need to get the hell out of here. Um, yeah, no. At- Go ahead. I, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think for sure there is like, you know, uh, we got to give it up for Skarsgård. I mean, I think he's a great Pennywise. And I think, you know, he he does the heavy lifting of in both of these movies. Um, I, I found him to be his performance to be really effective, especially when he does like oh, that yeah. sl- the, the slack jawed, like he's creepy. And then he just kind of goes into like yes. th- that was super like really, really well done. But I do think like a, an example of the gratuity and how it could have been dialed back. There's the moment in the second film where Bill uh, goes to scream into the sewer and he says and he's asking the sewer questions and nothing and he gets no response. That is really like refreshing at that moment in the film is like sometimes the scariest thing is that he doesn't answer you. Sometimes right. the scariest thing is when you yell into the void and it's just empty. Right. Like. You could make Pennywise scary because he refuses to answer their questions. He refuses to, like, give them the comfort of being the boogeyman for them. And, like, that's a beautiful moment. But here's an example of how the movie can't really, like, (laughs) stick to its guns. He turns around, walks away from the sewer. And I'm like, wow, that's maybe the best scene in the film that he doesn't, like, Pennywise doesn't show up when he's summoned. And then, of course, he shows up. And then, of course, he starts taunting him from the sewer and I'm just like, you couldn't have just left it silent. You couldn't have just yeah. like left that moment, which I think there are just a lot of moments throughout both movies that less would have been more. Well, like uh, that scene where Eddie is downstairs and the leper is in his face. Yes. And like that, that scene. Okay. I've literally tweeted, I hate Eddie so much. I want him to die sooner. Okay. <laughs> and... <laughs> And then that scene hit and it was the first time I was totally drawn into Eddie. I was just like, like stereotypical edge of my seat, like totally into this. And then angel of the morning started for some fucking reason. Yeah. And I'm like, you took this powerful thing that made me completely change how I felt about your character and you ruined it with this this thing that serves no purpose. And and like you said, I feel like they kept doing that throughout. I would be totally into something and then they'd add something and I'd be like, what the fuck? Yeah. Like that scene with Bev and Mrs. Curse, so fucking strong. And then what if we have a CGI monster with giant swinging tits? Yeah. That'll yeah. get them. Ha ha ha. Great. Like the movie is so good at setups and so bad at payoffs. That's the, it's the like thing they about can't that. End the joke. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> that is unfortunate because I mean, so many, I, I will give it to, to uh, Muschietti is he's really good at the premise. Like he's really good at getting you into the scene as you're saying, like, like when he's going down the stairs under the pharmacy, like you, it's got all the elements you need. Everything's there for a great scene. And then it just goes way over the top. And it's like th- this, the payoff was so much there for you. Uh, you had all the fun house pieces in place, but you had to go with like just the gross out, like put, poking his eyes out and the vomiting stuff. And it's just, yeah, for me, I, I feel like this, the both films would have benefited from a little more restraint if they, if they'd have been practiced. Even the vomiting didn't bother me because Eddie's so terrified. Like that's his fear. Yeah. Like, so that works in that situation for me, but I just, I, I don't know what they were doing with this song or why it was played for two seconds. And, uh, yeah. But well, and and when he does the vomiting too, with the leper, like the first time we see the leper, I'm like, great. I mean, this is a, is a natural choice, but the leper, the leper shows up so many times that by the end of the second movie and again like if you want this to be interesting repetition you have to do something with that yes but they don't do anything with it and so by the time like by the fifth time i'm seeing the leper i'm like you know what's going to happen don't you the leper's going to come out somewhere because we've seen the leper like so often 
that I like I'm bored with the leper. By the time I see him the last time, I'm like, oh, here he is again. Here's this guy. It it does not work for me at all. And, and maybe that's also true of Pennywise. Like by the time you see him, you know, in all of his guises in every possible like by the end, I'm just kind of bored with Pennywise. I mean, he's just even with a really good performance put in by Skarsgård, by the end, I'm just kind of like, yeah, I get this guy's deal. Like, like I'm, I'm familiar. We we've, we're acquainted. Yeah. Pennywise's power really lies in those scenes. Like when he's talking to that little girl under the bleachers or whatever. Exactly. Like, like he is so good at that. But again, going back to what you said earlier, he's in the shadows. It's harder to see him. Yeah. And, and we know, we know he's fucking with her. And that raises our tension and it's just, it's played so well. Like that's one of the best scenes in both movies together. Like that scene, I, agree. Mm-hmm. I, I could agree. rewatch so many times and I'm not going to argue Tim Curry versus Skarsgård, but this is my favorite Pennywise scene altogether in everything I've seen. His, his performance here is magical. I want, I and, want him. I want him to be more like Christoph Waltz fr- from uh, Inglorious Bastards. Oh. I want like <laughs> I want him to be somebody who like in that scene who like has interesting dialogue that is totally engrossing and terrifying. Like I want more of those confrontations, less of the here here he is as a giant spider. Like yeah. I want more of like him because he's so good when you just let him sit in a dark room and talk to them. Like, this is what I need. I do not need to see him, like, you know, moving around like the girl from the ring. Like, that that's not as interesting. I uh, totally agree. And I feel like uh, this whole thing would be better served if it was a series, like a full season. Because then you could get, like, all these nuances of these different things. Like, one of the powers to me is how messed up Derry is. And Derry, no matter the book, Derry is always a fucked up place on its own. And King does a really great job of making this town its own character, right? Mm -hmm. But in it, one of the reasons that Derry is so fucked up is its influence on Derry. And I, I would love to see a whole season where we see like how his power as it's starting to come back is like making people make darker choices. And, yeah. and growing from there. And that, you know, that's why we get Adrian Mellon's death. And that's why we get these other things because this influence is supposed to be so strong that it literally affects everybody. And we don't get that with the adults when they return. I, I would love to see them getting darker and, and trying to actively fight it. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. And I think, you know, like you really could uh, give these characters more imperfections and more like inner demons, like maybe their trauma and their response to it is not always the right response. I I just feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff you could do with that. That would be super interesting. The the thing that I found interesting about this, it's not just Pennywise itself, uh, itself, uh, because apparently this is some, some other type of being, but the the use of fear and you know the theme of fear between these two films and and what people are afraid of and how uh, you can have cyclical trauma or or you know trauma that returns periodically and how Pennywise is able to manifest that fear for any of the characters that he co- or any of the people that he comes in contact with, whereas uh, the little girl you just mentioned he really doesn't man- manifest anything for her other than that I guess the the fear of something out there because she's not even she's not really f- afraid of him um at least the way that she starts to interact um or but, but really my question is you see how pennywise takes advantage of what people are afraid of what would it be for either of you that would be you know something from your childhood or even just from adulthood or life in general that it could possibly use against you or it could take advantage of. Uh, Oh boy. Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, um, you know, the, the surface level things about, you know, like I, I have a, a long standing fear of sharks and have not been in the ocean 
uh, in my life just because of that fear. That's probably because of Jaws, right? I guess that's where my love of minimalist uh, horror really started was seeing Jaws at a young age and just being totally like under its spell. Um, so there's stuff like that that would be horrifying. But honestly, I think the uh, the greatest thing Pennywise could use against me is probably true of a lot of us. I mean, not fitting in. Uh, I guess the, the fear of um, not being popular, not being accepted, like the fear of being left alone uh, and, and being unimportant. I mean, for like kids, like w- what else is there but to be accepted by other kids? Like, like isn't all of the, I mean, not all of it, but aren't the like big fears at that age, just this like overwhelming fear about like, what if the, what if the girl I ask on a date says no? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, or, or what if like what if we're at the dance and someone makes fun of me like what if my friends don't think I'm cool anymore like those are the fears that to me are like the deepest <laughs> like I can we can all I'm sure but remember like visceral moments in your childhood in which it was kind of like I don't think these people really like me or I don't think that I am actually a very cool person and and I'm never going to actually fit in with this group of cool kids like that kind of stuff is just so so weighty back then i mean when and when you're older of course you see how silly it is in retrospect but at the time it's like man that stuff is heavy mm-hmm. uh mine would be a global pandemic that cancels all conventions <laughs> <laughs> and i i can't do panels and i can't sell books no okay um my real answer is actually kind of similar uh, Don knows I always blame mermaids. I claim that I'm terrified of mermaids, but that's not it. It's large bodies of water that I can't tell what's in it. Yes. Like there's something about that. That's just fucking terrifying to me. Now, if you amped that up and I couldn't see land in any direction and I know I don't have the skills to survive this, like that's, Oh my God, that that's terrifying me right now. Um, other stuff, obviously anything to do with my kids, um, anything to do with people I truly care about, um, maybe even Dawn and, uh, no, I'm kidding. But like you go back to, uh, the fear of not fitting in and I think I could deal with that better than what I'm about to say. If there were no people anywhere, like if I woke up in a Pennywise world where everything's the same, but there's no people, I would enjoy it for a single day. No, um, that would terrify the shit out of me. Like being yeah. completely alone. There's no one else anywhere. And I can't like, I can't Facebook anybody. Like there's literally no one else. Yeah, that is, that is unsettling. I, I think the, um, for me too, it's, it's that scene with uh, Bev and Ben, with the projector and they're, and they're after school. And, uh, and again, it goes way over the top where she like becomes a flaming skull, like Nicholas cage. Uh, (laughs) and then you're kind of like, what, what is this? But, uh, and that's actually the closest you mentioned earlier, the like, you know, Pennywise and Bev looking alike, like that scene actually does something with that. But the, I think it's that moment where it's like, (sighs) You, I, I thought you might have feelings for me, or I thought that you might like me, and I was wrong. Like I, I miscalculated, and secretly or not so secretly, you're like, yeah, you're you're not, you don't matter to me. Like that revelation is terrifying, right? Like the person you thought who cared about you revealing, actually, I don't, I don't actually care that much about you at all. Like that's the great horror, and. Like, like that, that in that moment is so weighty of like, oh, Ben is just realizing like the girl is telling him, oh, I don't think like I couldn't like someone fat and gross like you. Like that moment is so raw. If they hadn't turned her into Nicolas Cage <laughs> with a flaming skull, like that moment alone would have been terrifying enough for for me uh, in oh, my, yeah. my own like school years. Yeah, and and, and I go back laughing to laughing through the hallways. Yeah. I mean, like yes. that's, that is really painful. Yeah. But I just go back to how strong that would be if it was Richie and Eddie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it would be so much worse as an adult, I think. And then you add in the LGBTQ thing as well. 
Like, I don't mean as an adult in general, because most of us have the experience of having been rejected enough times that we, you don't get used to it, but it gets better. Right. But I think in Richie's case, like really sitting down and admitting his feelings and then having that go sideways. I think that would have been so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I know I keep coming back to that, but I'm really disappointed they didn't do it. You have a right to come back to it because think think about it, it think about it this way you have the moment where he's at you know playing street fighter and is trying to make another friend whether it's somebody he's actually attracted to or just you know someone new and he says hey you know you want to play another game and the guy's like why are you acting so weird and you see that that you know uh um oh my gosh uh the other guy the the bully shows up Bowers. and then start yeah starts throwing those those epithets at him you kind of you kind of question that that's one way to handle it. I'm sorry, one way he would react to it, right? This is somebody he already doesn't like, already somebody he's fearful of. This isn't someone who is significant to him as far as someone he should care about, someone he associates with. And if you did throw it into where it's Eddie, they're hanging out, they're riding bikes, or they went to go swim together, and you know, kind of like the scene from from uh, Moonlight, where it's the it's the two boys who obviously are i guess into each other but you have this moment of vulnerability between the two of them and it it ends romantically right this opportunity is is missed as you point out as you both point out because you could have had that moment where richie is feeling comfortable he drops the guard down and then kind of the same thing eddie looks at him calls him the f word and and starts laughing at him and you know pushes him off the cliff you know, he falls into the water or something. Or you could have had it back in school where he's just laughing at him and 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 just ridiculing him the whole time. Or it's just done in front of a bunch of people and everybody now knows his secret. I want to congratulate you on a really good attempt to get out of telling us what you fear. <laughs> I'm not done. I wasn't going to laugh about it. <laughs> no, I agree with all of that. I, I really like the idea of pushing him off the cliff as well. Like, that's such a... Such a beautiful symbolism. I, I feel like we should start writing the series soon. Um, anyway. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's probably the, the two things that it would have been at that age. At that age, And I'm not revealing any secrets here. The person that I'm speaking about knows about this. Um, but at that age that they were, it would have been my dad. Like all Pennywise would have had to do was turn into my dad. And I would have been, I would have been done. Uh, because that was the one person I was the most scared of in my life up until he told me <laughs> up until he told me, I guess when I was around 16 or 17, we were just having a heart to heart. And I told him something was like, you know, I, I don't like coming around here because you're always this. I think you're going to, you know, I'm, I'm worried you might hit me or whatever. And my dad looked at me. He's like, do you know how fucking big you are? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, if I tried to hurt you, to hit you, You'd probably kill me. And I just, at that point, I was like, yeah, fuck you, old man. I'm bigger than you. <laughs> yeah. But it was still one of those things that in my back of my head, like anytime I do something, I'm like, oh, God, this is going to piss off my old man or this is going to do whatever, right? Um, but I think around that same age as as, as Richie and, and, and Eddie, I probably would have had the same, and I'm saying for myself, not for them, confusion about my own sexuality because... Within these peer groups, there, you know, there was the whole thing, which was you got to be a man. You can't be, you know, the the F word. You can't be gay. You know, gay was gay itself was used as a pejorative. Calling someone homo had the same weight as the F word. Right. So anytime I did something, I was like, oh, I got to be extra macho because I don't want somebody to think I'm gay. Oh, my God. You know, just how stupid it was to think yeah. like that back in the 90s. Like, I don't want anybody to think I'm gay. No, I'm going to go play football and, you know, grab a bunch of other guys. And you know what? Maybe I'll join wrestling and wrestle around with them. So it was one of these things where I started looking. I'm like, none of this, none of the arguments you guys are making sense. Like, you're saying I have to be hyper masculine. But the hyper masculine stuff is the stuff that you tell me not to do. Which is, oh, well, you shouldn't be grabbing on guys. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be playing at roughhousing and stuff like that. I'm like, but you're you're trying to get me into the sports where it's the same thing. I'm confused. To the point where I even said ridiculous things like, you know, if it was a game and somebody smacked you on the butt and was like, hey, man, I'm not I'm not down with that gay shit, man. Don't touch me. And people on the team were like, what are you talking about? I was like, man, I, nope, don't touch me. 
And so you had to turn in this whole like extra macho bullshit of, you know, I have to let you know that I'm not that way. So if you're thinking that way, uh, change your mind. And I think that's that might have been the defense that that Richie put up at, at least early on of like, oh, I'm going to tell all these dick jokes. I'm going to talk about having sex with your mom and that's so I'll do all this other stuff because I'm not sure where my sexuality is. I'm not sure, you know, how it's affecting. I don't know how you're going to react to it. So I'm going to keep it bottled up by projecting all this 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 hyper masculine shit that I know is going to make me look uh, kind of cool if I say it and. Uh, and things like, hey, you know, if we're going to go in this house, man, I, uh, we we just need to go ahead and measure each other's dicks. And and whoever's the smallest has to stay out here. You know, whatever the stupid thing was that he said <laughs> in the first movie. Um, <laughs> but but as far as an adult, I, I, I would probably have to agree with Jim. It would have to be something along with, with, with my kid. Um, you know, whether that is how she possibly feels about me as a dad or a person. Oh, man, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. Because the whole Beverly thing. Thanks a lot for a new fear, you big jerk. (laughs) (laughs) The whole Beverly, like Ben moment in in the in the uh, in the room after he wakes or sorry, when when he's woken up in the room and he thinks that she's there. uh, That that immediately made me think about what a how I would feel about an interaction with a girl being my daughter, like going forward. Like if I was sitting there talking to her and say like, oh, yeah, you know, we. Because kids say weird shit anyway, but uh, if, if she were to say something like, "I I know how you really feel about me, Dad," and like, "What the fuck are you talking about? You didn't want me. I was an accident." Blah blah. You know all these weird things that that kids like. I probably said to my parents like, "Oh God, I wish I was adopted," or just have this moment where she says something like, "I wish you were never my father." Like that would completely just destroy me. Is it? Was, isn't it interesting, like as you're as you're talking about this, because that's definitely true for like once you're a parent, the the terrors of being a parent are so omnipresent, like both oh, yeah. oh, psycholo- yeah. psychological and just day to day. Like, please don't put your finger in the light socket. Like, I mean, it's just like <laughs> like basic, like please. And and my kids aren't even old enough. Like, I can't even imagine when they can like drive their cars or go like you know out with boys or whatever. I mean, like we're talking about next level terror. Like right now, it's terrifying enough just to make sure they don't crack their skull open when they're walking down the street. Yes. And it's interesting to me, though, that when you think about it, it like cancels out both parents and children in a way. Because mm-hmm. like the, the parents become like the mother at the very beginning of the first movie playing background music. The parents literally become like a backdrop that is not significant. It, like... Very, very little, like one interaction with Bill and his dad, and his dad is so irrationally cruel to him about coming to terms with his brother's death that you're like, man, like, like it was really, uh, like unfeeling. Like the the parents are so like divorced from connection to their children that it's like a peanuts special or something. Like adults are all want, 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 and the kids live in their own world. Mm-hmm. And then there's no children. They, as adults, they don't have children. And there's no real time spent thinking about the children of Derry other than the one kid who gets unceremoniously devoured and is just like a momentary, you know, unearned feeling of fear or whatever. It's it's interesting to me that we don't really deal with parent-children relationships in it, even though that seems to be like the nucleus of the whole thing. It's interesting to me how they don't have kids of their own, like none yeah. of them. Yeah, that's really weird. And I thought that that would be another thing I would add if I was rewriting this. The The Ben and Beverly thing at the end is great, but can you imagine if they had a child? Like just that... That unease of like, is it really dead? We've killed it before. Right. I would personally be, uh, I would be down for a Pennywise origin story. Somebody's got to get on to like just a show called Pennywise and uh, go back to like the old timey circus and go back to like Todd Browning freak show type stuff and like really, right. you know, get like get the aesthetic of like 19 teens uh, circus life. I feel like that would be super interesting, uh, 
story to 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 deal with to try to unpack some of what um why pennywise is so unsettling uh and, and that'd be very doable right i mean i feel like Scarsgard would be game for something like that you could you could make that happen ah uh, i think that'd be amazing if you cast him like that would that would make my day yeah i would watch that more so I don't know. That really interests me. Also, like, as you were speaking, I was like, you could do a whole season of like different decades or different times he showed up, you know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, like how WandaVision's been doing the the different (laughs) decades thing. Sort of like, uh, sort of like Castle Rock, but not, but Dairy instead of Castle Rock. And I feel like Dairy, you could do the cyclical thing. Castle Rock's just kind of this sprawling universe. But dairy is more like repressive cycles. You could do a really interesting, like every every twenty year cycle from you know the the beginning of the nation until twenty twenty one, and it would be a super interesting series. In your research, have you seen any real difference in how the politics are related between the two towns, or are they like super similar, or like has that not come up at all? Uh, I think the politics between the two are um, different in that, I, I again, it comes back to, I think, the entire, like, metaphysics of both towns. Like, Derry is cycles. Derry is, like, people trapped and, repeat like, repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, and that just shows up, like, Dreamcatcher, it, so on. And, like, that's just, that's the world of that. But the world of Castle Rock is way more the world that I described earlier when I talked about like don't don't trust the citizens, don't trust the masses. Uh, Castle Rock is like needful things, and uh, it's the place where the masses are irrational and ugly, and you just have a sheriff who's just desperately trying to maintain some semblance of order. Uh, and so for me, they have different. Yeah, different sensibilities altogether between Castle Rock and Derry. Derry's where you go when you want to get real dark and oppressive. And Castle Rock's where you go when you want to deal with uh, consumerism run amok and and people who make poor choices. Uh, Yeah, that to me is how I I view the two universes. Although they have similarities, I think there is that fundamental difference. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I was just really curious because the stories I like usually take place in Castle Rock. So I was wondering if there was like a big difference between the two. I want to jump to something completely different. And I'm going to ask this. uh, I'm going to start with you, Don, because of your your major history background here. This uh, native tribe that is incorporated (laughs) into this film bugs the living shit out of me. And uh, I just I want your take on. Like, is this lazy? Is this racism? Is this lazy racism? What the fuck is happening here? I think it is. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> I I think it's 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 just this weird idea, or at least this weird connection that we have to the to what's known as the noble savage mythology and, and things like that, or or um, the oh god, I forgot the other trope, but you know, just the whole idea that. Native Americans are more in tune with 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 nature and everything that's going out there. So of course they have the answers to to this. So we need to go ahead and you know I know they didn't say it was peyote, but we need to go ahead and have some peyote and and get into a sweat lodge with a shaman and he's going to teach us all this stuff. And my first question was because I didn't read the book, but my first question was like if they knew everything, why the fuck is is Pennywise still around? Why is it still around if they if they knew how to get rid of him? And of course, that's revealed at the end uh, as to why you know he's still around. It's because they failed; they didn't do it right. Um, but yeah, just it, it, it's almost as bad as when a, a house is haunted because it's built on top of an Indian burial ground. Um, it it does strike me as as one of those things that you could have you could have had this story without it. I mean, you could have had um, Ben or even uh, or even Mikey in, in, in the sequel. They're reading about how to get rid of a demon, and and you know it just happens to go through all these books of the occult, uh, and and how to get rid of it, as opposed to hey, there's this local Native American tribe that has all the answers, 
Uh, and you know what? We're going to use the uh, we're going to use the magical Negro to do this. No, I, I totally. I mean, it is a very Stephen King thing. Like, it, it in no way surprised me because of the fact that Stephen King so relentlessly uses Native American exotica to you know fill in the gaps. You know, with pets from Pet Cemetery and The Shining. On down, it's it's almost always you know uh, the 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 curse of the Native Americans, and so even though it, it's clear that like the white man is to blame, even though you know clearly uh, he he's very rarely blaming Native Americans for being demonic or evil or whatever. It's just these questions of representation. Of like, okay, so the only Native Americans we get to see are smoking some, you know, variant of peyote and are going through these very, like, primitive sort of rituals. And so, like, it just it strips the characters of any kind of semblance of uh, humanity. Or, like, yeah, why don't tell a little bit more about the story when they failed? It would be more, more interesting to find out the details behind that particular part of the narrative than just all of the usual bells and whistles. I mean, it's the usual, like, there's someone drumming and there's someone chanting, and mm-hmm. it just reduces them. And interestingly, of course, it's Mike who's connected to that because, you know, as Don was just saying, it, it, there's a very thin line that separates how the King universe treats Native Americans to how it treats uh, black men, who yep. all they all end up becoming magical they all end up becoming like in touch with the ethereal realm or whatever, uh, and as as a you know as a consequence, becoming one dimensional cartoons rather than three dimensional interesting characters. So to me, like that, all that Native American stuff is just confirming an ongoing problem I have with race in uh, Stephen King's universe. You guys really hit exactly what I didn't like about it. I wasn't sure if this was in the novel or not. So it is not. This was not, a... it, it is not like they the sweat lodge that they do in the, is in their fort. And so like all their knowledge about Native Americans is all very like third hand. And there's, there's no real engagement with an actual tribe. Uh, so there's much less of it in there, but that in no way like lets Stephen King off the hook because mm-hmm. although it's not prominent in it, it is prominent in places like Pet Cemetery. Oh yeah, where like it is everywhere and it is really pretty offensive in most spots. So like I wouldn't, you know, just because he didn't include it in the novel, it's definitely uh, pretty frequently employed. I-, I think we covered a lot of ground. I mean, we we touched on a lot of important mm-hmm. stuff from the film, so. Um, thank you both for really having a good conversation. I think it might come across as though I only had negative things to say about the films, but in fact, I do think there's some, there are some interesting and promising things scattered through both films. I I did, for instance, in the second one, I really liked the way that, um, the way that they were interweaving how the stories bled into each other. Mm -hmm. And so was that there was that opening shot where they kind of come up through the puzzle that Stan is making. And then there was uh, Ben's house. Yeah, no, that was from Ben's house. And then it was up into Stan's puzzle and then Stan dripping blood and it drips onto Bev's face. Oh, I right? loved that. <laughs> Those the interconnections, because that's really like the novel does a lot with that. The the way that these stories weave together and kind of are it's not just one story, they're all a joint story. And I feel like in moments he's doing some pretty creative editing and some pretty creative camera work to do to play with that and to make that really, I, I think visually pretty interesting. It's just there's just not enough of it to to be honest. There's just too much standard fare mixed in, not enough of that kind of creative stuff. And I feel like uh, Muschietti has it in him. Like you can see that there's a lot of promise. Like I, I feel like he could make a really great horror film if he could just kind of strip some of that excess off of it and and get down to the bare bones. He clearly has some tricks up his sleeve that I really appreciated. And I, yeah, I just, I, if, if he can continue to do some of this and develop it, I, I foresee that he could make a really interesting horror film one day. Well, and I always wonder how much of that is 
producers and for sure and uh you know studios and whatever else because you just you could almost hear like studio notes saying like yeah. can can we get like this kind of aesthetic or this kind of like how about you do a jump scare that's kind of like the you know asian you know, j-horror stuff like how about in this you try to do like it's so derivative of all these different kinds of little things horror films do and I think intentionally so, but you could almost hear like everybody saying, you got to do one of these, you got to do one, you got to include this, you got to, and it just all got piled on and, you know, not, I don't know, you know, maybe it's too like auteur way of thinking to think that he could stop that from happening. He, pr- he probably didn't have a ton of say to cut that stuff, but I, I think the setup, like we said before, the setup for him is really good. He knows how to set up a good horror sequence. He knows he clearly gets like how to get us there. It's just the payoff wasn't always as good as it could have been. That's all. Uh, but I, I right. feel like it's going to be down the road if he if he's still directing horror. You know, I, I don't know if he's still doing horror if he's in another genre right now, but. Uh, I don't know. I, I saw promise there. Like they, they were not uninteresting movies. There was definitely stuff in there that was thought provoking. Well, even like some of his shots really cash in on the terror. And the one that immediately pops to my mind is when Ben is doing his Easter egg hunt. Yeah. And, uh, and he gets down there and you see the, the, the figure, but you can't see its head, right? Yeah. Cause it's cut off by where the door is. Yes. When it drops down and doesn't have a head, that's a great reveal. Yeah. And it's shot in a way that doesn't tip you off that it's coming. And it's not a jump scare, which is one of my big complaints about this film is there's a thousand jump scares for no oh, fucking too, reason. Too many. Yeah, too many. I mean, you, should, uh, you should be cashing in on this tension. 100%. That moment where it drops down and doesn't have a head isn't a jump scare. It's a holy shit moment, right? Yes. And, yeah. and for that, like for that second, I'm so invested that I'm Ben and I'm like, whoa, what the fuck? You know, and, yeah, that, those were really so masterfully shot because yes. it's, it looks so simple. There were some really interesting moments where he was doing like uh, background stuff where the, the figure in the foreground, like I'm thinking in the library, right before the, the library, sequence you're yes. talking about where the woman in the stacks just is slowly like she's not part of the scene, but you see her in the background, just like creepily staring at him. Like that happens a number of times where like in the background, the figures are suddenly like watching him. Right. Like they're, they're, they're doing these kind of, you know, background unimportant things. And then in the next shot, they're all like weirdly facing forward. Like that kind of stuff is so good and so not flashy, but very creepy and like raises that level of dread. Those moments were really good. And it, unfortunately, like, again, I'm thinking that another moment it happens is in the park with the Paul yeah, Bunyan's. The yeah. Paul Benu statue and like everybody in the background who's doing their own little festival stuff just suddenly is like robotically staring forward at him. And that is really effective. But then it's cut with, oh, here comes a Paul Bunyan statue trying to kill you with an axe. And it's like, yep, the fear is gone. <laughs> like any any trepidation or fear I had is gone because now there's a giant Paul Bunyan statue for some reason chasing him. And it, but again, like really good stuff mixed with really mediocre stuff. Yeah, I uh, I was talking to somebody, one of my friends, about Paul Bunyan <clears throat> and and swinging boob lady, and uh, and she was like, well, it's the it's the use of the CGI and the weird way it looks, mm-hmm. and it's this and it's that, and I argued that uh, scary stories to tell in the dark did the same sort of thing. And theirs are creepy as shit. Yes. Yeah. And and they work really, really well. So it can be done. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. 100% it can be done if it's done, like, well. And not gratuitously. Like, again, if I just got one of those, it might be effective. If I get, like, 50 of those, I'm a little tired of the CGI, like, giant figures by the time the movie's over with. Yeah. Uh, you just got to be sparing with that kind of stuff. And the one only the, the one thing I would say, too, that I 
I, I visibly was like just scoffing when I watched it the most recent time with my wife it was Henry getting kicked down the well. And like, it, it, again, it's like a, it's a logical or logistical thing that probably is like unimportant. But I was like, I know Henry has to come back in the second movie. Like, so when Mike kicks him down the well and he goes plunging down the well and then the second movie, they just have this like, OK, he's alive suddenly. It, yeah. it, it didn't like I was like, what? what? <laughs> Why did you like, you know, you're making the second movie? You know that this is a two part thing. Why would you kick him down the well? Like, and you hear him like bouncing off of stuff like there's no right. way he, he lives like, why do that? I just don't understand. <laughs> like, it just makes it so much harder for you as a filmmaker. Okay, we got to bring Henry back somehow. Even though we smashed him into, you know, a million pieces in the well, I guess somehow we got to drag him out of there and, and get him back. It, it was the mullet that saved him. Yeah, I think the mullet must have. He must have gotten, like, the uh, the levitation. With, with the, the mullet got some air velocity underneath it and, and saved him. Yeah. Um, yeah, I... I go back to this Paul Bunyan and and the lady Miss Curse, and I feel like both of these don't equal the fear of the person being chased, and yeah. and I think that's another place I lose it. It's not just the the special effects; it's that for me it doesn't add up in the story. You want to go creepy, Miss Curse making out with Pennywise, like topless, saying right. she's Daddy's little girl. That caches the fear. Oh, it's shit. scary as fuck. It, it's like all this stuff, right? Like, right. that's where you cache it. You don't do this thing they did. And, and I don't even know where to begin with Paul Bunyan, so I'm just going to ignore him. But like, <laughs> it, it doesn't work with the fear of the person being chased. That's what yeah. I don't get about it. Yeah, and again, like, yeah, if you could put, just put Skarsgård across the table from Richie. And, you know, like, just have him talking. Like, Skarsgård is scary. Just let him, like, give him some good lines and let him talk to him in creepy ways. And that's enough. You, Paul Bunyan does not do it for me. Like, I, I don't understand what Paul Bunyan has to do with Richie's secret. I don't understand why Richie would be scared of Paul Bunyan. It, it just it, like there's no it's not only not logical, it just emotionally is kind of just not effective. I I, I would so much rather have, uh, you know, the, the fear of just having Pennywise talking to them about their fears and find ways to get Skarsgård into intimate moments with these characters. Mm -hmm. And I, I would find that a 100 times more effective then here's Pennywise passing the baton off to the next CGI monster. Yes. That, that I, I don't know. I mean, it's a missed opportunity because Skarsgård is the star of the show. Oh, and God, yeah. like, you got to give this guy more to do than just be introducing the real horrors, which I feel like most of it is him kind of just saying, and here's another one. And here, here's something you're scared of. And then he just like, like you know the camera turns and it's some other weird cgi thing like let let skarsgård do some stuff let let him just be be him and man like that's the movie that's the whole thing right there yeah because even that part where it's it's pennywise as the as the 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 circus worker yeah when you see him without the makeup that whole like the 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 way they are able to convert him from human to Pennywise and that moment that was that was good I mean I shouldn't even say that was good that was a great transition it was a great creepy moment where you're seeing him without the makeup and then he just runs his hands over his face yeah, and cuts yeah. out the lines and he's Pennywise again oh so beautiful yeah it's and that, it's so good yeah that, that would have been a great moment as the two of you brought up as far as having that conversation between himself and and any of the other characters where it's it's him talking and then all of a sudden you know he just slowly turns in back into the clown and you know especially with Richie. Oh Richie, I know your secret. Uh right. you know, you're just right. going into what he knows and and you know, not turning Pennywise into a hero and saying, like, there's nothing to worry about. It gets better. Uh, right. but actually that would actually be way creepier if he's helpful. Because that that's what we like about the little girl under the bleachers. He's being helpful. Which yeah. is a giant red flag. 
Yeah, like like met, let him be the jolly clown with a dark underbelly more than he just becomes a demonic right. clown, more than just a clown who's like deranged. Have him be the cheerful clown. Like that's like Tim Curry as Pennywise, I think is so effective because he's so like cheerful and, you know, so happy and yet so unsettling at the same yep. time. I think both actors do that so well. Um, that, you know, just, just exploit that. That's, that's everything. And if you can do that well, that's all you need. You don't need a ton of CGI effects to, to magnify that. That, that does its own heavy lifting. I think that's a good place to wrap it up today. Uh, we've, we've covered a lot of ground here. So at this point, we usually bring it to a, what films should people watch if they enjoyed this? And so Don, I know you have a list a hundred, hundred miles long. <laughs> I and I just caught Michael defer. off guard with this. So, Don, if you want to go first, you certainly can. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll do this. Uh, the The first movies that come to mind for me, and I and I might have mentioned them earlier, um, it would be Annabelle uh, Creation or Annabelle Comes Home uh, would be a couple for me. Uh, the Boy. Uh, I love The Boy. Oh, gosh, what was another one that was out there? Um, you know, oh, really gosh, fast. That, the boy yes. does the thing where the abusive boyfriend comes like literally from America to Europe to track her down. Yeah. And so they did it better than it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's uh, hereditary. I know, I know I met, mentioned that one. Um, oh, and as far as like non horror, I would actually recommend the outsiders because it has a whole idea of community and friendship. Uh, I know the movie James is going to mention, so I'm not going to ruin, uh, I'm, ruin it by saying it before he does before he has a chance to mention that film but oh just, just be- go ahead because i don't have a list yet well, i was gonna say stand by me oh yeah of course but you know i was um, thinking horror sorry go ahead oh no uh but those would be the ones that that really stand out to me what about the two of you um you know for me i guess obviously stand by me even though i didn't even think of it just now i i'm gonna go with needful things because mm-hmm. i feel like needful things really cashes in on individualism, like what you really want and and how the things we desire can come back to haunt us. But it also really hits the community as a whole trying to deal with something. And and I would argue that the movie is definitely not fantastic. It's one of my favorite books, but uh, I, I I really like Needful Things. And so that's that's my list. You know, I, I'm not necessarily sure that uh, I, I would not advise watching uh, Dreamcatcher. It was uh, terrible. But Dreamcatcher is, in, in my estimation, operating in the same universe as it. I think it's the unofficial sequel to it. Mm-hmm. It's, um, you know, a, a group of friends who are united to each other in psychic kind of ways and who are dealing with the latest manifestation of cosmic evil this time in the woods in in Maine but the i mean the the film is is just so bad that i couldn't recommend it um i guess related i would say todd browning's freaks i mentioned that right. earlier but just oh, yeah. if you're in the mood for general unsettling circus culture uh that that's a go to for me for sure um I'm trying to think if there's if there's anything else. I, I mean, uh, I always like Juon because uh, the the original um, because it's also dealing with generations and inheritance and uh, and how things get cyclically passed on. Okay. And and that's an you know the original Japanese film does some really interesting stuff with. a, a community and a, and a place that that just passes on its evil. Uh, habitually over and over again. Um, but I find Juan to be a little more uh, interesting than either of these It films are. So I don't know. Those are the two that come to mind immediately when I think about related sorts of movies. Uh, the one that I want to add to it is The Mist. And yes. I know you oh, mentioned yes, yes. the story earlier, and it was yeah. fun because you mentioned the ending in the in the book. Yeah, And The Mist is the number one place I will say somebody had the balls to write a better ending. And and that film's ending is one of my favorite endings in anything. 
Yeah. And I I want to cover it very soon on this show. So let's say April. I'm going to say we're going to cover it in April. But uh, yeah, the mist. I I feel like that really gets that whole community and that whole I can't trust you and the just everything that everything I don't like and how it's presented in it is better represented over there. Yeah, I mean how communities get uh swayed by fanatics and so forth like that it is a really uh a very political Stephen King story for sure. So let's bring it back to you. Dr. Michael Bluen, tell us where we can find you on social media or buy your book or anything else you want to send out to us one last time before you go. Sure thing. I am woefully not on social media. I don't know if it's woeful. Maybe it's maybe it's a good thing. I don't have really social media because I'm just not super. The community aspect of it uh, is too haunting for me, I think. So I don't have that, but I do. Uh, I, I will recommend, um, hopefully, if you're interested in the stuff we talked about today, I, I have a chapter on it, the novel, uh, in my new book, Stephen King and American uh, Politics, which you can find at the University of Chicago website, or you can also find it on Amazon or basically you know any other bookseller, uh, local bookseller, whatever. Um, so I, I hope you might go out and, and check that out. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, the, I, I would, I, I think people who listen to this and who are interested in the kinds of things we talked about today would definitely enjoy, uh, the book. So I, I would, um, you know, hope, hope they go out and check it out. Very cool. All right, man. Well, thank you for being here today. This has yes, been yeah, fun. Thank you. So yeah, thank you so much. It was great. I really enjoyed it. I've, I've just really enjoyed how, um, you know, this really proves the purpose of this show. It doesn't matter how I personally feel about a film. The social commentary in this is strong as shit, right? Like it is, it's definitely there. It doesn't matter, um, how any of us feel about it. We can talk about films. We absolutely hate birth of a nation. I'm looking at you <laughs> and, and how they influence uh, you know, or how they reflect societal concerns when they came out, how they reflect it today, how we interact. I mean, all of that to me comes back to everything you said about community and how community influences us and how we influence it back. And I mean, I don't know. I'm just occasionally uh, grateful to be reminded that that I don't have to love something to talk about it. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, I mean, I am so with you on that because in 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 one of the books I wrote, I read all of the novels by Danielle Steele, and that is just proof that you do not have to like something, <laughs> even a little bit, to study it or to think like it's interesting to talk about. It. It's worth it's worth talking about this stuff, even when you don't like it. I mean, I, I don't like a lot of Stephen King's stuff and the book reflects that, but boy, we really do need to wrestle with the issues that are on display. And I don't really like Danielle Steele's writing, but she is the third most, uh, you know, best-selling author in human history. Yep. So I should probably know a little bit about her just so I understand my own culture. I mean, understand like what we care about and what, a lot of people seem to be interested in. So yeah, I, I, I think the, what, what you all are doing here is great. I think Don, you'd probably argue that, uh, I'm even more analytical when I don't like things. I would definitely, uh, <laughs> I, I, I've, I've, I will say that. And I have said that. <laughs> like, I really don't like this movie. It's like, Oh, there's going to be a good one. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, let's let's be real. Like sometimes the analysis that happens with some of these things is, you know, not in a totally pejorative sense, but can be done just by like fanboys and real criticism when it gets too mired in like the fandom of it. It becomes just like a celebration. It's just like, yay, this is perfect. There's nothing wrong with this. This is great. And and it is way more interesting when when you have some problems with it like like i feel like we we got into some really interesting territory when we were talking about the stuff that isn't so great uh, about the it films so yeah i totally agree all right man well hopefully you can come back sometime and we can talk about some more films because this has been great so yes sounds good well thanks so much for having me but uh, to both of you that, that was really fun 
<laughs> Absolutely. So until next week, as always, I am James Sabata. And I'm Don Guillory. And we will see you back here at the Necronama.com. <laughs>